All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank, thank you so much for coming. It's really, uh, I don't know, I'm overwhelmed with emotions <laughs> for, for finally being able to have an event in person. Um, and we're trying out, you know, obviously to have a hybrid event. So we have, uh, we're streaming uh, on YouTube and we're gonna accept questions from uh, uh, remote people via Slido. Um, so bear with us as we experiment with this new normal, right? <laughs> um, so uh, I'm Emiliano Di Cristofar, I'm the director of the uh, UCL Academic Center of Excellence in Cybersecurity Research. So just uh, um, a, a very brief overview of what, uh, for those of, you, those of you who are not familiar with the uh, ACE uh, scheme, just a few words of uh, what is it about, who we are, and uh, you know, I think in like four or five hours, <laughs> just five minutes will be done. All right. So, what are the what are these A's? What are these uh, academic centers uh, centers of excellence in cybersecurity research? Well, I think the name is kind of self-explanatory, right? Uh, it, it's a scheme uh, run by NCSC. It used to be run by GCHQ, and then NCSC sort of spun out uh, of GCHQ and. Uh, with EBSRC, which is you know the UK sort of National Science and Engineering Foundation, uh, and keeps funding um, funding to us, they recognize a sort of world class research. So I, I believe we have 19 centers across the UK, um, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and really, the goal is to have this recognition, as you know, we do. Uh, top class research and, uh, and sort of establish a, a sort of a network across the, se the center, uh, support and enable collaboration. So we have, you know, in a couple of weeks, there is also uh, a conference, of, of including all the uh, ACEs. Um, again, you know, first time in three years <laughs> that it happens in person. And overall, the goal was to uh, uh, support NCSC and uh, driving up the level of innovation and uh, sort of enhance through training and research and, um, and outreach, enhance the UK's knowledge base, providing uh, um, top quality graduate training in cybersecurity, all right? So what do, we, what do we do? Why are we an academic center of excellence here at UCL? Well, I think most, um, if, if I were to ask, you know, what, when it, 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 people, what they think about, you know, what we do here at UCL, well, I think that publications and sort of uh, high, uh, impact uh, uh, publications is the, probably the first thing that comes into mind. Um, you know, overall, uh, UCL computer science is one of the um, you know uh, top uh, universities in Europe and in the world uh, for sort of these top tier publications. Um, we do also many other things, right? So we contribute to to standards. We we're very active in releasing uh, open source code. Um, Many of us serve in government government advisory boards. They work with NGOs and advise startups, um, and we have a lot of collaborations with with industry. And these are just uh, some examples that uh, that you can see on the slide that came sort of off the top of my head. I'm sure I'm missing a lot a lot of companies. Um, we also done uh, quite a lot of work. Uh, some of us in commercialization. Uh, there's been spin off. You probably heard of Chain Space was acquired. Up we hired that night never understood the, the, the difference in, in the wording by, by Facebook. Um, and overall, we've, we've done a lot of work and our, our research is enabled, is powered by a number of uh, research grants that we've got throughout the years from places like the, you know, the EU Commission, uh, UKSSC, NCSC, NCSC, UKRI, and so on and so forth. Uh, we also have a very big education component um, so we, we have a, uh, it's been like, I think three years now that we have a, an undergrad module um, in security uh, in our second year program. And um, I, I just finished uh, teaching it actually for the first time with 180 students and it was a really rewarding, really fun, um, uh, fun thing to do. We have a specialist, specialist one year masters an MSc in information security, which is also certified by, by NCSC. Um, if you're interested in knowing what that means, uh, please ask me during the break. Obviously, we have a, a large body of, uh, uh, of people in the group. So we have a number of PhD students and postdocs and 
We also have a center for doctoral training in cybersecurity that uh, funds and you know recruits uh, five to ten students each year um, to, to to work on very broad aspects of cybersecurity, and the CDT is particularly um, in, is interdisciplinary in, in nature. Again, if you are interested to, uh, in knowing more, please uh, find me at the break. So uh, I also want to kind of give a, an overview of who's in the center, right? So we have a number of faculty um, in um, not only computer science, but also in other uh, departments and, and other faculty, in fact. And uh, so just a, a, quick, a quick overview. We have Madeline Carr, uh, who joined us last summer. She's a professor of global politics and cybersecurity. George Donezis uh, works in, on privacy uh, technologies and blockchains. Myself, I work on privacy, particularly privacy machine learning and online harms. And Lorenzo who joined us, uh, joined us last summer as well. Uh, works in system security and trustworthy ML. He's actually our latest uh, person to join the, the Academic Center of Excellence. And that's a tradition for us. It's always been to have these events and have the latest uh, member to, to sort of introduce themselves to, to the community and give a talk. So thank you so much for answer for that. Um, Marie Basek, who uh, works in security <coughs> economics and cybercrime. Uh, Angela Sasse is an expert in uh, human-centered security. Philip uh, Jovanovic is also here, works on uh, cryptography, blockchains, and, and privacy. Stephen Murdoch is also here. Information Security Research Group uh, and is going to chair uh, the panel that we'll have after the break. Uh, Sarah Michael John uh, works on cryptography, cryptocurrencies. And like I said, we have uh, people outside the Information Security Group that are part of, it, of our academic center of excellence. So really that recognition is given to the university. So we have many different aspects of cybersecurity happening obviously in other groups and other departments as well. So this is non-exhaustive list of, of people that you know, have an interest in security and uh, collaborate and get involved with uh, 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 with uh, with the center. So Mark Handley and Brad Carr, for instance, from the Systems and Network Research Group, uh, from the uh, from Crest, the Center for Research and Evolution, Search and Testing. I have Earl Barr, David David Clark, uh, Jens Klinke from PPLV, uh, Programming Principles, Logic and Verification Research Group, Byron Cook, uh, David Pym. Uh, and as I said, we have uh, staff from either from other departments as well, like Irina Pras and Leoni Tanzer from the uh, Department of Science, Technology, Engineering and Public Policy. They work on uh, economic aspects, social, uh, social regulation, uh, things like uh, security, the relationship between security and gender, um, in particular with respect to IoT. Um, and our last, uh, our last event, they, they gave very interesting presentations and I believe that we have recordings of, of that online. Uh, we have also uh, in, faculty from uh, the Department of Security and Crime Science. Obviously there is a, a big overlap uh, with, with things like cyber crime. So we have Professor Shane Johnson, uh, Ingalls who's also here, uh, the, the Cyber Crime Organization on Cyber Security, or Enrico uh, Mariconti who does uh, malware and cyber crime. We have additional members like uh, Mirko Mussolesi, who actually used to be in the Department of, uh, of Geography, moved to computer science, or she do, uh, and, and we have other collaborations also with um, electrical engineering, EEE, and we have some new members coming, uh, joining the, the, the center, I'm not a liberal. To yet to announce who, who, who they are, but we're gonna have three new members two new faculty in our department and one faculty in EEE. Actually, she's already announced. I can announce her, Anna Maria Mandalari uh, from Imperial. She's moving to, to UCL in EEE, uh, Electronics and Engineering um, uh, Department, um, sorry, Electronics and Electrical Engineering Department, and she works on privacy and IoT, so she will be joining uh, the center as well. Uh, so just a quick overview of the agenda, very easy. We'll start, like I said, with Lorenzo. Um, he was gonna give a talk about his research on transport AI for System security. We'll have a, a coffee break um, uh, uh, right after this talk. Then we have a panel uh, on, on the online safety bill um, and kindly moderated by, by Stephen. And we'll finish with uh, um, a, a really exciting keynote by Brendan. Um, thank you so much, Brendan, for coming uh, all the way from, from New York for this on the prospects and pitfalls for machine learning in software security. 
Um, so I just some quick notes about sort of housekeeping. Um, obviously, you know, it, masks are no longer mandatory. We are uh, kindly asking that people consider wearing one uh, to be inclusive for people that might be at risk or, you know, maybe uh, anxious about, uh, about COVID. So thank you so much, uh, everyone, for, for, for wearing one. Um, the Wi-Fi uh, is GC Wi-Fi and the password is Pineberry44. And for those of you who are streaming uh, uh, on YouTube, uh, you can submit questions. Uh, there are three rooms on, on, on Slido. You just click on this link or, or use this uh, QR code um, and you'll be able to, uh, to ask questions. So you can upvote, downvote questions in case there are many. We, we pick up the, the questions that are mostly most upvoted. Um, and again, please bear with us. We're, we're new in, uh, on this. So, um, right. So then last but not least, I really want to thank uh, the people who made this event uh, possible. Uh, Silpa, thank you so much for all your great, great work in, in organizing these events. And I'm uh, really um, also grateful to the Good, Good Enough College for hosting us. Very beautiful, uh, very beautiful place. Dave, Dave as well, who helped us set up um, everything, you know, with the, uh, with the, with the tech. Um, and uh, the communications team at uh, uh, UCL, but Gia and the others. Um, and I'm sure I'm forgetting, uh, I'm forgetting a few people, uh, but thank you so much also, uh, uh, all of you for, for, for being here. Um, it's, uh, it's really great to see you all. But thank you so much, Lorenzo. You're... All right, can you hear me? Good. Um, thank you, Miliano, for the kind presentation and to actually outline the ACES. It's all about the ACES, right? Um, <clears throat> and thank you so much for um, coming over. I know that we're still living in the shadow of COVID and uh, also we're very excited to join in presence events. So I'm very excited as well. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a perspective of um, what is my research agenda and what it means to me trustworthy ML for system security. And I guess, you know, the part that I'd like to really highlight is that trustworthy ML is just to set the scene, but the for system security is the distinguishing part that uh, sets a little bit aside from uh, what else you might have heard from you know, trustworthy ML in general, trustworthy AI. Usually you do see this problem instantiated on top of computer visions or language tasks. And in our case, and in my case, I'm focused on systems and more specifically on software. And I'd like to understand, you know, whether there are common challenges, there are common questions, but also whether there are opportunities for prioritizing a little bit some of the questions that we are interested in. And to get there, <clears throat> I gave a talk, um, was actually part, I guess, of my hiring process last year. Um, I, no, it was not hybrid, it was completely online uh, at UCL. Well, somewhere in the world, but then streamed at UCL um, on this aspect. And I wanted to give you a little bit of a recap to set the scene. Um, so I'm not gonna go over everything that I mentioned in that talk because it will be pointless. I wanted just to give, use a few minutes to give a little bit of context and background and to highlight some of the aspects that I uh, focused on during that talk and then to dive into what follows in, in my uh, line of research. Okay, so I guess that it's pretty much undeniable uh, the success of machine learning. And for the purpose of this talk, I'm gonna be using machine learning and AI interchangeably. We know that are different things, but just bear with me with this little uh, abuse of language. Um, so we, 
we read about successes of uh, machine learning pretty much on a daily basis. Uh, now, one of the most recent, I guess, uh, um, uh, news that I read about was about DALI, which is the software that uh, I guess it's uh, it's from DeepMind. Oh no, it's from OpenAI. Uh, it's from OpenAI, and basically you just describe in natural language um, a description of of a picture that you like to have, and then DALI generated for you. So it's really cool. So it's undeniable that in computer vision tasks and in natural language processing, we have reached superhuman performances. Okay. Um, one can ask whether we have the same status uh, in security as well. But we've been using machine learning for security tasks for decades. Um, when I started, so I guess that I started my uh, getting interested in security in the late 90s. And one of the first videos I read about um, around security or machine learning applied to security context was around anomaly detection. So back in the early 2000s, it was mostly about anomaly detection. And so we've been using that and then we started to learn about challenges, uh, the problem with gathering data sets, training, computational power, and kind of, you know, a little bit wore off over the years. And now it came back again as in resurgence because of, because of all the advances that we have here. So, but the question is, if you look at papers, uh, even publishing top tier conferences, it's very uh, common to find performance that boasts uh, 99 F1 scores or as close to, to that. Now, if that is the point, well, I believe that we can say that the problem is solved. Like, you know, I, I guess you know it's it's pretty much clear that if we have such a big perf performance, then the problem is solved. But the question that we're trying to that we're trying to understand is whether this is truly um, uh, true, whether whether we're really solving the problem, or whether there are some other questions now that we should actually focus on. Always consider performance. So performance is one of the questions that we need to be looking at, but there are other questions. Like for instance, robustness against adversary manipulation, robustness against data set shifts that are permeating security context by their own nature, explainability and so forth and so on. Um, so basically um, one thing that probably sets security apart from other application domains is that security is adversarial. So, and this is by its own nature. So you have attackers that try actually to bypass and break systems. This is true, not just in machine learning, but in machine learning as well, machine learning for security or the secure machine learning. But also you do have threats and attacks that evolve over time. And therefore, because things keep on evolving, you need to keep, keep up basically with this evolution. Not only this, sometimes the way that you decide to abstract specific uh, uh, objects, software, might not be the optimal way to describe semantically what you want to deal with. So there is a point with images, just to make a very simple example, now it's clear that if you use a convolutional neural network or something, they're similar to it, you get to very good performance in general. Now with software, so that is the way that you try to learn features from images. Now with software, what is the right way to do it? It's just you know doing some static analysis, doing some dynamic analysis, building a graph, extracting some, some APIs that the software might actually invoke, uh, extracting strings, uh, using large language models, and I guess you know Brando is going to talk about this uh, later on to try to analyze this. What is the right one? I guess you know it's not clear what is the right one yet, but each abstractions that we um, use will influence the pipeline one way or another. It will influence our ability to answer all the other questions, robustness against adversarial manipulation, drift, explainability, and so on and so on. So, but just everything stems from one specific problem that basically the assumptions that these algorithms rely on is IAD. So trained data and testing data should be drawn from the same distribution. If this doesn't happen, and it doesn't happen in real life, then you have to face adversarial manipulations, drift and so forth and so on so um and this is you know basically just to, to recap a little bit what i mentioned about uh semantics and abstractions like if you look from our understanding uh the way that we want to represent semantics like for us a rabbit is a rabbit and it's pretty much um uh, we should be pretty much sure that this our definition our understanding what makes a rabbit wouldn't change for thousands of years um, but when it comes about software, it's a little bit trickier. Like, let's assume there's a very simple example. 
and this is all artificial toy examples. But let's assume that, for instance, there is a moment in time where um, ad fraud is the predominant threat. Okay, so now you just focus on ad fraud, so you're training data is made of ad frauds, you try to engineer features or maybe to learn features using some deep learning process, um, and then you deploy your, your classifier. Uh, now, because of that, you start basically detecting a lot of ad frauds uh, attacks, and the attackers then start to either manipulate the way that it that, that actually makes the challenge basically the way that you extract features or to learn features, or they actually decide to move to different type of threats. So for instance, if you become very good at detecting ad frauds now, you know, we decide that maybe we can monetize our attacks with ransomware. And this is a very, very artificial example, like a very simplified view. And here again, basically what happens is that if you start observing our, um, ransomware, if the features that you have learned for ad frauds are very different from the one of uh, ransomware, then basically you observe that as a shift. And at that point, uh, your classifier will start making mistakes and then you have to keep on retraining and keep on understanding the problem and so forth and so on. And this is like, you know, a uh, you know, cat and mouse game, basically. <laughs> now, this stems from the fact that at least when we talk about specific application domains, we are very far from what, what we call this platonic ideal of semantics. If we were able to capture the semantics of a piece of software or a function, then we will have a much better understanding of what the software will be up to. And we'll have a much better understanding to understand whether the drift that we observe is because there is a change of semantics or there is, a, instead of a change in the way that we try to approximate the semantics. Um, and this is still a very much open problem. Um, so this is what I believe we need. So we need to understand and improve the effectiveness of machine learning methods for system security, keeping in mind that there is this adversaries in the loop. And in specifically for what I believe is important, the representation, so the way that we represent objects is very important. So the way that we abstract a piece of software in a form that is suitable to be digested by machine learning process, by machine learning uh, algorithm is very important. So uh, different abstractions will have different implications in the entire pipeline, but also um, will incur different costs to get to that sort of abstraction. So say that you, have, you wanna have a very, a very precise static analysis, there is a very inherent cost even to run that analysis, which will have to do some approximation already on, on its own. Whereas some other analysis might actually be lightweight and will, may actually uh, still achieve very high performance. But perhaps they might actually very be brittle against adversary manipulations or uh, data set shift. Um, so, and I guess, you know, this is what I'm trying to advocate is that we cannot longer reason about just machine learning applied in security context as is. We need to uh, inherently reason about the intertwined relationships between the way that we abstract the problem from software program analysis and uh, how this in had implications in machine learning processes. And the question that I stand is a little bit provocative and say, you know, under this uh, uh, premises, is trustworthy AI um, for system security even possible? Well, I hope so. Like, you know, I, I hope so. And there's always uh, good. So, and I guess it's about raising the bar. So some of these problems uh, might not be solvable completely, but if we raise the bar enough, that is good enough. That was a not a pun intended for the place that we are, but you just came out of it. <laughs> so, Okay, so this was the original outline that I had when, when I gave my talk here. So, and I focused on the first part on adversarial machine learning attacks. Now, I just want to give you a very super quick recap on what happens. Like, I'm sure that you have heard about adversarial machine learning attacks on images. So, the idea is that you have an image, you find an optimal perturbation. So, you add some noise, which is not random noise, but just a noise that is optimally derived, uh, so that you end up with an adversarial image. And um, in general, there are different ways in which you can do this, but in general, it's about solving optimization problem. Whereas you care about at least minimizing the perturbation, the delta in this case, the delta perturbation, and also uh, the loss to the target class that you want the, the adversarial image to be misclassified um, uh, from. Um, why you want to minimize the perturbation? Because at the end of the day, you want to have an image that still resembles the original image. If your perturbation is too big, then you end up by having some image that is completely messed up. And you want to preserve that sort of semantics in the image. Now, in software, 
Um, so, and we, we basically explored this in, in uh, uh, a paper we presented uh, a couple of years ago, actually, uh, Attribute Security Privacy in 2020. So in software, things are a little bit different because as I mentioned earlier, uh, you need to first rely on an abstraction. So how you represent the software, then at that point you build your feature vector and um, uh, you find your optimal perturbation and then you create your adversarial piece of software. Now, there are a couple of differences here. So one is that you no longer need to necessarily minimize the perturbation because you no longer have an image. You have a piece of software. So what does it mean to minimize the perturbation? I can add as many, as, many, as much code as I, as I want to make the software adversarial. But I have to make sure that there are some other constraints that get satisfied. For instance, I just want the software still to run. I want the software to be real. So I just want to make my perturbation in the feature space. I need to create eventually an object, a piece of software that behaves adversarially. So sorry, that behaves still as with the original semantics, but is misclassified by, by the classifier. So there are other constraints that we need to take care of, not necessarily minimizing the perturbation. And most of them is, uh, stems from identifying the transformation we need to apply to make the software uh, adversarial. We need to make sure that the semantics are preserved and we need to make sure that the software is plausible and support so on. We need to make sure that what we end up with is a realistic threat. Um, now, I just want to maybe show you one, um, oh, sorry, there's also one other aspect that is unclear uh, that you don't have usually in computer vision or another task uh, that where whenever you, that is called as the uh, inverse feature mapping problem. So whenever you do these abstractions to a feature space, you create your adversarial example. Well, adversarial example exists in the feature space, but you need to go back to the problem set, what, what we call the problem space. So that inverse part, uh, where it's simple for images because the feature mapping function is invertible and differentiable, it is not for software. So it's not necessarily invertible and differentiable. In general, it is not. So how you do that, it's an extra challenge. But one might actually question is, so why do I care about doing this? Well, if you don't do this, but the threat that you have is a threat for the classifier, but it's not a realistic threat. And we all reason in security about within a threat model, but the threat model has to have many, many um, uh, desire of, of um, uh, threats descriptions, but it has to be one quality. It has to be realistic. If it's not a realistic threat model, it is useless. Um, so there is probably one image that I would like to maybe have you to remember after this talk, which is probably not the easiest image to, to remember, but just to make the point of what it means to create this perturbation in the problem space. So imagine that we have two features to represent an object, okay? And you do all these arrows represent the direction of the gradient from an area of malicious points, the red one, towards the area of benign points. So the goal of the attack is to move a point from the red area, adding this perturbation until it gets to a blue area. Okay. So in that case, you create an adversarial point. Now, because of the constraints that we identified earlier, that you're no longer interested in just minimizing the perturbation, but you're interested in satisfying other constraints, you can identify in this region sub-regions that satisfies those constraints. So let's say that you start from a point that represents a software, X, that belongs to one of these regions that we call problem space visibility region. Now you perform your attack in one way that we're not gonna deal about the details here. So you end up with this X plus Delta star, which is this optimal adversarial point that moves the point from the malicious region to the benign region. Um, at that point, this is a point that is adversarial. So it will make the classifier, uh, it will make the classifier make a mistake in the prediction but it's not necessarily a realistic point. So you remember that from this point, we need to create an object, we need to create a malware, for instance. So now we need sort of to project this point into one of the pocket, this problem space feasibility regions that satisfy the constraint that I mentioned earlier, like the semantics of the original malware has to be preserved. The malware has to run correctly, and it doesn't have to give away the fact that there's been some manipulation going on. So, as you can see, there is an extra term, eta, that appeared in this projection. And basically, this means that X plus delta star is, so delta star is the perturbation you need to add to the point to make the point adversarial. But the eta term is there to make the point, to make the attack realistic. 
And there are consequences, of course, you know, of this, uh, of this extra term in terms of attack success rate, in terms of defenses. To cut a long story short, uh, because you're no longer, this is how the reformulation of adversarial machine attacks changes. And you know, this is the only formula that you're gonna see in the slide, in the presentation, okay? So I'm not gonna try to you to focus on all of that, but basically all the constraints change the, for the reformulation of, of adversarial machine learning attacks because you need not to take care of not minimizing the perturbation necessarily, but to satisfy these other constraints. And just to give you a little bit of insight in why this is, why this matters. Now there are certain, um, there's a strain of research that works on certified machine learning models that give basically protection against adversarial uh, attack within a certain sphere of perturbations. So they can give guarantees if the perturbation is up to a specific upper bound, okay? Now, if you may notice here, uh, we no longer care about minimizing the perturbation. So we can actually overflow the sphere of protection and therefore break all these systems. Uh, not because our attack is clever, but because in the problem space, in specific application domains, you don't care about minimizing perturbation. So basically we need to revisit all that line of research and see whether we can actually make it more challenging for these type of attacks. Now, this is not the slide that I wanted to show, and I don't know why it came here. I'm really sorry. Uh, give me a second. Give me another second. I'm not sure what happened, but I'm here. Sorry, I need to reshare things. Okay. So this is the slide I want to show. Now, that was to give you a little bit of a, of a background. So the problem of why all this happens is because of this data set shift, okay? And this is the slide that I that I showed you at the very beginning, right? Where you do have basically this IID um, assumptions that are violated. Now, I wanted to recap what happens in terms of adversarial, and you can see adversarial as a worst case data set shift because this is created by attackers. Um, but the question is, okay, Without looking at adversarial attacks, um, of course, you know, there might be some issues even when you deploy machine learning models, not in adversarial context, uh, in the sense of adversarially, sorry, in the context of machine learning related adversarial attacks, but even in the context of normal operation. So once you train a model, we mentioned that eventually you might observe that as a shift because the threats might evolve because the way that, or perhaps because the way that you the site to represent specific objects is no longer the right abstraction and therefore there is a shift from that abstraction. So the question is, can we do something about that? And this is one of the work that we've been working on for quite some, some time. Um, so we work, uh, I would say you're gonna take for the past five to six years, not full time, uh, but uh, it's been something that we initially uh, proposed uh, in 2017, so it was published using security in 2017. And, and in that work, we kind of, you know, had the intuition on how we could tackle this problem. Um, and now we just presented SMP 2022 with a lot more better understanding of uh, the theoretical underpinning of why this works. And, you know, we try to generalize across different application domains and different tasks. So you can think of just the, so basically the way that we deal with this data set shift is try to detect when there is a data set shift in specific tasks. Think about malware classification tasks, okay? Just to give you a very specific example. And basically what we do, we just equip the classifier with a rejection option. So um, the classifier works the way that it is, but there is, the pipeline is enhanced with two components. One is called the conformal evaluator and the other one is called transcend. So the conformal evaluator basically builds a statistical support uh, for the classifier prediction. And that this statistical support is then passed on to transcend, which is uh, basically the rejection mechanism that deems a point to be of high confidence or a very low confidence. And basically if the points are very low confidence uh, are rejected and otherwise are accepted. Now, the key point here is 
we, we should reject points that the classifier would have misclassified. Because we can always have a rejection option that works very well by just selecting a few points that are very uncertain and then uh, reject only those. But this, the chances are that basically the classifier will perform very badly, very poorly, because um, you only select the, the most confident predictions and all the others are rejected. So in that, but the, having a classifier that rejects also classification predictions that would have classified correct. So two components, confirmed evaluator is the st statistical engine that builds the statistical support that is used by Transcend to basically reject points. Now let's try to understand um, how this works. Um, so in this works, uh, uh, we just provide the theoretical, as I mentioned earlier, the theoretical understanding of why Transcend works. And we try to optimize on, on previous aspect of the paper that I'm gonna be going uh, in a second. And also we try to show this, showcase this, not just on um, one specific domain, but across slightly different tasks. Um, uh, so it's always about malware, but it's in different, uh, with different feature representation, different algorithms. So Android malware detection, Windows malware detection, and PDF malware detection. Um, so basically, um, as I mentioned, Conformal Evaluator is the statistical engine that drives transcend uh, rejection strategy. And uh, this stems from uh, the Conformal Predictor uh, theory, which basically is able to emit, it's just a mechanism that emits um, a prediction set uh, with certain, that gives guarantees that your prediction is in this prediction set up to a specific confidence level, okay? So, and this works uh, based only on two assumptions, exchangeability, which is a generalization of IID. So IID, what I mentioned earlier, of having a training data set and testing data set that are drawn from the same distribution. And of course, you know, we want to detect drift. So we want to detect when these things start drifting apart and uh, closed word settings. So closed word settings means if the classifier is trained on uh, dog and cats, uh, at test time, you don't see any object that belongs to a panda class. So you only see um, objects that belong to the class, the label space that the classifier was trained against. Okay, and to get there, basically, uh, we rely on a notion that we call but the confirmed predictor theory calls non-conformity measures. So the non-conformity measures um, is derived by the underlying classifier, which produces a score that tells how dissimilar each example is with respect to prior example. And um, you can end up by having all sort of different uh, non-conformity measures uh, for different classifiers, because basically, because the non-conformity measures is derived by the underlying classifiers, you it's it's pretty much classifier agnostic. Of course, you have to design the non-conformity measures properly. So in this case, for instance, uh, just focus on maybe on the first uh, example, but the blue region basically represents the regions where you have points that are more dissimilar to the testing object, that's, uh, the red testing objects with respect to the black class, to the respect to the point, to the black points in, in the class. Okay, it, as defined by the non-conformity measure that you have considered, which is derived by the classifier that you are using. Okay, and so at this point, we want to then quantify this measure uh, with p-values. So basically, we compute p-values uh, for each point, and the p-values is just the ratio of the less similar points over the more similar points. It's just a way to quantify this this measure of non-conformity, of dissimilarity, okay? And um, so this is where things start to get interesting because as mentioned earlier, uh, the, the confirmed predictor uh, emits a prediction set. So you've given and provides guarantees given a specific significance level, an error, an epsilon error that you are willing to accept. So let's start to look at the, um, at the extreme. So if your error, if you, want to have no errors, so your epsilon, your significance level is zero, then the confirmed predictor emits a prediction set that contains the entire label space because it has to provide guarantees um, when it makes a prediction. So if I need to provide a guarantee and you don't want to have any error in your prediction, the only way that I can do that is just to emit the entire label space in my prediction set. The assumption is 
that it's IID, so exchangeability, and closed world. So I cannot see another testing object that does not belong to that label space. Now, if you want to go on completely on the other side, you end up with a say, okay, I, I don't care about the error, so I, I can have as many errors as I want. Well, at that point, you can also say that uh, you need to emit the empty set because you don't know exactly if, if the prediction is correct or not. Okay, so we're talking about significance level. In one case, the extreme, I don't want to have any error at all. So the only way to get a, a prediction that gives guarantees is to omit the entire label space under the two assumptions that we had there. On the other case, if I, I'm willing to sustain any error possible, then I can even give you the empty, uh, the empty set. Okay? And um, of course, the interesting part is for us is when you have that sandwich label space between the empty set and the and the uh, entire label space. So in that case, you can, for instance, you have a p-value associated to that, uh, to that class, and uh, we can compute two metrics. So you can compute two metrics even if you have multiple classes, of course. So one is called credibility, and the, one, and the other one is called confidence. So the credibility is the uh, p-value of the class. Uh, so it's the highest p-value uh, in your prediction, and the confidence is one minus the second best option. So intuitively, what do you want to have? You would like to have a prediction that has a very high p-value. So it is very likely that the point fits into that class. And you want to have a very high confidence. So the second best option, so the, the p-value of, of the other classes should be very low, which means that under these assumptions, there are no other classes where, where your prediction will fit at best, other than the one that I'm telling you, OK? And this is a kind of, you know, the, the, the interesting connection between confirmed predictor and confirmed evaluator. So confirmed predictor makes predictions. So it gives predictions, sets, given a predefined level of confidence or significant, significant error. In confirmed evaluator, basically, we can interpret low credibility as a high probability of an impossible result. So for us, a low credibility as a high probability of having violated the IID assumption. So of having or witnessing drift. And this is basically our, our key observation. So confirmed evaluator builds all the statistical support and then for sense try to find the suitable pressure. And I'll try to understand a little bit better how this works. So uh, once confirmed evaluator has built all the p-values, now transcend has to identify a per class threshold that works in practice. So, and this is done during the training and calibration phase, where we actually look at the p-values between uh, the correct predictions and the wrong predictions. And according to a specific, specific constraints uh, that you want to satisfy, for instance, you, you want to reject at most a specific percentage of drifting points, or you want to achieve at most, uh, sorry, at least a specific performance, Transcend basically calibrates this um, uh, this product, this p values and finds an optimal threshold that is then used um, at testing time when a point come in, comes in. So when a point comes in, the classifier um, makes a prediction says the point is malicious. For instance, okay. Then we build a p value corresponding to this point, and then we see whether the p value of this point is above the threshold that was found by, by, by transcend or is below or below the threshold found by transcend in the class that the classifier has uh, emitted as a, as a prediction. And if it's above, then we accept the uh, classification. If it's below, we reject the classification. And once we reject the classification, there are, of course, you know, a number of interesting things that we haven't fully explored in that piece of work that we're working on nowadays. Uh, so of, uh, things that you can do. Of course, you know, once you reject points, so you still need to deal with those points. And there are different strategies that you can rely on. So you can rely on active learning to relabel a certain percentage of the points and try to return the classifier. Or you can end up by doing something clever, more clever than that. But this is out of scope of what we're trying to do. Now, so you're talking about poison? Yeah, this is done in, so yeah, it's a good, very good question. So we assume that there's no poisoning. So there's no, there's no attempt to poison the data set. So when we do the calibration, 
the data set is under your control. So you have, you're sure about the label that you have, which is a challenging task on its own. Right. When you apply it to wire, you might be say it's adversarial. Yes. I'm the attacker. I'm going to want to get an attack at some yeah, yeah, you get at the assumptions, and then if so, the idea is basically if you are outside of our assumptions, we, you should have the point actually should have a very low p value, so it should fall below the specific threshold that we found uh, during calibration. Um, we're assuming we're assuming in this case we're not assuming adversarial that relies on adversarial machine learning attacks to to uh, to bypass the classifier. So we're we're dealing with natural drift basically. So with things that you you observe because threat has changed or because the feature representation has changed. But we're not talking about yet what I showed earlier about, you know, carefully crafting adversarial points that class, that cause the classifier to uh, misclassify the prediction. There is a connection between the two. So that is a shift and adversarial. We are working on it, and but we haven't done an experiment yet here to understand whether this works well there or not. Um, it, it is it is so let, let me let me say that let me say that that it's it all stems back to, to the non-conformity measure that you define okay because a good non-conformity measure gives you a very good statistical support um a bad non-conformity measure will yield horrible results even if the classifier works okay in iid okay so if the classifier works okay in IID, but then you 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 derive the wrong non-conformity measure, then all of this that I'm mentioning doesn't work at all. So it works very very poorly, basically. Um, now, luckily enough, there has been, I guess, 20 years or so, no, maybe more, of research in conformal predictive theory that explored different um, uh, non-conformity measures given different classifiers uh, that we can actually start to build up on. Um, so if you remember earlier, I said that, you know, confirmed evaluators has to build this p-values uh, to start with, you know, the community measures and then p-values for all the points that you have in your training data set. Um, now, how do you do this? There are different ways in which you could do it. Um, okay. Um, there are different ways in which you can do it. So the original formulation, uh, it's called a constructive conformal evaluator, which stems from constructive conformal predictor and basically build p-values in a leave one out fashion. So you take one point of your data set, you, you leave it out, and you train your classifier on the other points, and then you compute the p-value of this point. Then you do the same reasoning for the second point. You take this out, you train the classifier on all the other points, and then you build a p-value for the second point, and so forth and so on. So this is clearly, um, uh, you know, it's rooted in the CP theory. It's, it gives you guarantees, but it's very computationally intensive. You can imagine that as, as your data set grows, uh, you training and leave one out. Uh, so if data set is a size N, you need to train N classifiers. Um, and, and this doesn't really work in practice when you have a large data set, a realistic data set. So even in the cases, uh, I'm not even talking about industrial cases, but even in the cases that we are dealing with on, you know, in, in the order of magnitude of hundred thousands of applications, this is not possible. So clearly you need to do something else. So the second option is to approximate transductive performance evaluator with batches. Okay, so basically here you, uh, you, you train, uh, so you train based on, K classifier, if you assume that uh, you have, you create K batches of points. And um, so you reduce the number of classifiers into train to build these P values. But the this is an approximation. So it's not rooted in particular theory. So if it works in practice, it's very empirical and you're, you, you cannot really give any guarantees. The reason is that you're assuming that the decision boundary of the batches doesn't change too much when you do this uh, kind of training, uh, which you don't know, of course. So uh, this was not very satisfying. So we, we wanted to really try to see whether we can improve, improve better. And here also we, we uh, borrow from the conformal predictor theory, which defines inductive conformal predictor and cross conformal predictor. Um, uh, and we created the equivalent inductive conformal evaluator and inductive, uh, sorry, and cross conformal evaluator. That is in the next slide. So in the inductive conformal evaluator, uh, it's, it's, it's very simple. So basically, you partition the data set in a proper training data set, which you train only once, and then a calibration data set. So the, the bluish part you can see in the slide. So uh, basically, 
The advantage is a computational advantage because you train only one classifier and then you build the p-values of all the other points in the calibration data set, okay? So it's very computationally um, uh, efficient. However, it's informationally inefficient because you're not using all the knowledge of the proper training data set to build the statistical support. So remember, everything stems from the non-conformity measure that measures the, the similarity of a point given to prior example. Here, you are limiting the number of examples that you can exploit. So the limiting the number of knowledge you can exploit. So as something in between, um, we, um, we also propose cross-conform evaluator, which is inspired by capable cross-validation in terms of how you partition your data set. And basically, you train K, uh, um, uh, K inductive conform evaluators, basically. So each of that row is an inductive conform evaluator. You can do this in parallel. I need to wrap it up. Oh. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Um, so basically, here it's you. You take the advantage of the ICE, which is very professional efficient, although informationally inefficient. But because you do this in a careful validation inspired way, you still use all the points by training K classifiers. So in a way, you are achieving what you wanted to achieve with a little bit with the approximate TC. But in a more formal way, in the better way, uh, that is rooted in some um, guarantees. Okay, getting to the end. So we have experimented this uh, over uh, different data, uh, Android, um, Android application, two hundred sixty thousand application that spans five years. No, yes, almost five years. Um, very simple classifier, linear linear support vector machine. Very simple feature space, binary feature space. Zero if you have that API in, the, in, a, in an application. One, sorry, zero if you don't have it, and one if you have this API in the application. I'm oversimplifying just to give you an idea of how the vector space would look like. Windows PE. So Ember, uh, it's it's a data set industry released, uh, 117,000 applications um, that spans a couple of years. Uh, GBDT as an underlying algorithms, and then a PDF malware uh, from a, a work called Hedos that has uh, almost 190,000 applications uh, that spans a shorter time span and uses random forest. Now, Hedos um, features are, are engineered to be robust to drift. And we chose that example because also we wanted to understand whether Transcend would still help in that situation. So you would observe a far less drift because the features are engineered to withstand drift. But we wanted to see whether we can also do something there. Now. And as there are some thresholding of optimization for Transcend that we can tune depending on your uh, on the desired needs of the practitioners, of course. Um, so I just wanted to show you. Uh, I, I guess these are the results on on um, Raven, and further details are on the papers. It's a fairly dense paper. So here, if you look at this plot, you can see. So the interesting things that you have to look at is the dashed line. So the dashed line, the dashed gray line, shows the. Uh, the baseline performance, so how the classifier performance decays over time because of drift, okay? And you expect to have a downward trend. Now, of course, it's not a steady one because this is a real data set. So some applications will still that you observe are still in distribution and some other are drift. So that's why you see a little bit of a, of a upward and downward trend. But if you build like a trend, you can see there's a downward trend. Now, the other things that you wanted to have a look at is the histogram at the bottom. The histogram at the bottom shows um, the drift rate, so how many applications have been rejected uh, over time in each time unit. The blue line is the F1 score um, of the classifier um, of the classifier um, uh, for the elements that have been retained. So for the elements that has, have not been rejected. And then the red line represents the F1 score of the element that the classified that transcend has rejected. So ideally, you want to have a high blue line because the F1 score of the things that you retain is high. You want to have a very low red line or almost a zero red line because it means that you are rejecting only examples that would have been misclassified. This is the performance that the classifier would have given to those examples if you hadn't rejected them, okay? So you want to have a very low performance on them. Um, and that's it, basically. So this is on a proximal TC. The second one is on IC. And you can see that um, you have a similar performance in terms of uh, K 
cap element and rejected element, although you tend to reject uh, a little bit more, so towards the end. Um, and then the next one is CC. So, and CC is a kind of, a, you know, a, the other approach to build the statistical measures. You can see that you achieve a slightly better performance for the element that you keep, but you start making, so the classic, the rejection option start making a little bit of mistakes. So it rejects some of the points that shouldn't have been rejected because the classifier would have, uh, would have um, classified them correctly. Now, another thing you have to look at is the computational time that is required to um, build all this statistical support. Only a training time, of course. Um, so an obvious question. Yes. Um, why are the blue and the gray lines always like collapsing towards the end of the testing period? Like it seems they seem like this one. Yeah. This one here yeah, that's going down. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. And all of the others as well. Yeah, because we don't have data. We have very little data. So Okay. One, one thing that we should have done is to cut it earlier. Uh, so we, we wanted to run, but we don't have much data. So the statistical support is, is very little. So you, so you make, make the sense. Uh, and also, this is, of course, you know, a picture, an overview over a very long time frame. In reality, you don't deploy classifier, you observe the drift, and we don't do anything. So ideally, you do something in the very early months. But we would just want to show that, it, which where it works much better, of course. So we want to show that basically you can achieve very high performance, reject things that you would have misclassified, and you have a quarantine cost of the points that you reject. Now, what you do with that one is something we're working on. Now, the obvious question is, okay, but why all of this? You have probabilities, like many classifiers output probabilities or confidence levels. Why can't you do all of this, like a, an optimal threshold being on the probabilities? So the reason is that many of the times the probabilities are not, most of the time probabilities are not calibrated. Um, and we look at, of course, we build the statistical support looking at all the other points that are in the training or calibration data set. But if you wanted to do this against probabilities, this is the graphs that you end up with. So as you can see, even at the very beginning, there's a, a lot of confusion. So probabilities cannot really distinguish between something that is very high confidence and something that is a very low confidence. So we tend to say probability and talk about confidence, but the two things are very much different. Um, whereas in the CP conformability theory of consent, we have all of this. Now, we don't have time, but I wanted to leave you with very, uh, a very nice slide. So this is all, I forgot to say at the very beginning also that all this work wouldn't have been possible without the folks that are working in the system security research lab. Of course, you know, I'm just trying to gather the knowledge, but the hard work is always pulled by other people. And some of them are here, actually. Fabio, uh, Federico, and Mark are here. I'll be shy. <laughs> it was the pulling. So, and here is, you know, some of the avenues that we're exploring at the moment. So, some pitfalls in machine learning, so do's and don'ts in machine learning uh, for computer security, which will be appearing using the security in 2022. Um, then looking at the serial perturbation, problem space vectors, which connects very well with what uh, Peter mentioned uh, earlier. Robust features, because again, if you want to get as close as possible to um, semantics ideal of behaviors, that you should leave less opportunity to attackers to, manip to manipulate uh, the representation. Uh, what we do with the quarantine points, with the drifted points, uh, can you react to them? Can you anticipate the drift a little bit? And this is what Mark Prince is working on at the moment. And uh, ultimately, if we can get closer to our understanding of semantics, uh, I guess that this will give us a much better way to understand, so to explain why something happened, and also to be more robust to adversarial manipulation and drift. So, thank you. So um, thank you so much, Ben. So um, we had a coffee break starting two minutes ago. Uh, it's on me. Um, that's what happens when you have Italian speaker and Italian chair. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I'm gonna take maybe one question from Slido, and so I would suggest maybe people have questions to just prevent Lorenzo from having coffee. Um, and, <laughs> so one question we have in slide is, can you please clarify what kinds of assumptions, example, access, you typically consider in adversarial attacks in the problem space? Uh, what type of, sorry? What, type, what kinds of assumptions, like for instance, access? Um, 
when if one access against the adversary has against his models. Oh, you mean whether it's a uh, zero knowledge, uh, gray knowledge, uh, perfect knowledge, limited knowledge? Uh, I don't know. But I guess I, I'm gonna give. I'm <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm trying with that. Um, in in our case, uh, we uh, work under perfect knowledge uh, settings. So the attacker knew everything about the classifier, the feature space, the training data set, and everything. But there has been work, of course, some of the reasons about uh, the, say. Um, zero knowledge and limited knowledge settings as well. And uh, you don't necessarily need to have um, a perfect knowledge to carry on these attacks because you can build surrogate classifiers. You can, in terms of data set also, you can, uh, even if the data set might actually, the, the data set might be different if they come from the same time frame, chances are that they, they, they are in position of the same facts that you observe in that specific time frame. Now, how you represent the objects, that is an interesting question. So, and uh, I don't know, I don't know whether that is actually something that you should assume to have as a knowledge uh, because things will change radically, like, you know, completely. Well, thank you so much again. And please ask questions uh, during the coffee break. All right, so, and we'll start with the panel in uh, 15 minutes. Thank you so much.
sort of uh, group within within the organization looking at online safety that covers all about different areas um but just to give you an idea around um for those who don't know some of you will have a great depth of knowledge of the online safety bill but just what the aims and intentions of the online safety bill are um, it's very much about um, systems and processes so not individual pieces of content so just uh just to make that clear it's whether or not the systems and processes being deployed by um industry are actually um reducing the risk associated with a number of online harms that have been identified in the bill and uh, the bill is very long it's structured in, a, in an unusual way so i won't talk about that for too long it's 200 pages or so long um, and, and quite complicated but but uh, fundamentally it's um it's focusing um with a much higher um, view of risk so that, um, it, industry will need to carry out their own risk assessments based around guidance from ofcom um, looking at the likelihood of um, certain people using their uh, networks for certain things. So obviously um, to use an example, so if we're talking about a lot of children on a particular um, platform, the risk assessment should um, pay much more close attention to the risk associated with children using that platform. If, um, if the platform is, is, um, is known to um, have a lot of vulnerable people, um, for a particular um, harm, then we'd expect the industry to, to carry out risk assessments for whatever that particular user base is. Um, just to, to add to that, there will be um, codes of practice. So this is going to be guidance for industry um, to, to help with the compliant, regulatory compliant. But that doesn't mean it, it's a it's legal certainty, because there are some things in the bill still to be ironed out as it works its way through Parliament to decide on just what level of certainty that provides them and what powers Ofcom will have at the end of it, which I can't comment on too much at the moment because, like I say, it's still being negotiated in Parliament. Um, another, another element of it is transparency. So um, there's an expectation industry will report that um, in a transparent manner what they've done on their platform, what they've removed, what they've found, how they've mitigated the risk, and to be really clear um, on that. So, so citizens can see just what action is taking place. And obviously Ofcom will have a role there to, to make sure that that what is disposed in those transparency statements is accurate and, uh, and that will form some of our understanding of what's happening on platforms. Now, my area here of particular interest is, is technically focused. What is the art of the possible here? What are the challenges being faced by industry? 
how can I encourage innovation? Well, how can Ofcom encourage innovation rather than trying to use the, the stick all the time, I suppose, as far as everybody's fear, which is the, the enforcement nature? How can we um, pull together multi stakeholder groups to really address some of these challenges so that we don't have to go down the enforcement route? We've got a, a bit of a mantra internally at Ofcom, which is if we're enforcing somehow regulation has failed. Um, now that, that could be because we haven't got the message out to people correctly or people haven't engaged, whatever that is. But really, we don't want to get to the point where Ofcom is seen as this uh, sort of draconian organisation always hovering over, over industry. We want to work in a collaborative way because we're well aware that a lot of the innovation is taking place in these larger platforms. So, so we're, we're in, a, in a difficult situation really where we will have to be not only collaborating with them, but also um, the sort of parent if things go wrong. So, so we have got to uh, work that very difficult um, relationship. So that's really, uh, in a nutshell, is that, is that yeah, the sort of thing you're after? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'll, I'll pass you over to Thomas. Yes. Yeah. Um, so Tom, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. okay. Afternoon, everyone. Firstly, I'll apologize for everyone who wanted to see Richard Percy. You've got me instead as a last minute standing. Um, lovely to be here. So I'm Tom Farrell. I'm the Chief Impact Officer of a UK safety tech company called SafetyNet. And we are uh, one of around 45 members of what's called OSTIA. And for those who don't know, that is the Online Safety Tech Industry Association. So it's a UK organisation that, that corrals um, those involved in the safety tech sector somewhat and tries to use a united voice to to promote um, how the safety tech sector can help deal with online harms. So just before I go on to views on the online harms bill, just to give you a bit of a background to, to where I come at this whole debate um, from. So I was a UK law enforcement officer for 19 years, and probably the last eight years or so of that, um, I focused solely on trying to tackle the, the ever increasing issue of online child sexual abuse. So I've been involved in that from a, an angle of trying to catch those offenders who are harming children. And then about a year ago, I moved into the role I'm in now with Chief Impact Officer. As you'd expect, it's my role to make sure that our organisation are always focused on the interests of the children, because it's largely the children that we're trying to protect online from online harms. So in terms of the online harms bill, from the perspective of Ostia, um, our view is very much that, of course, it's welcome. You'd expect them to say that it's welcome. Uh, legislation seems to be taking effect around the world. I was recently at the We Protect Global Summit, where we heard from Australia, who have stolen the march in some ways on implementing online uh, legislation. And also, you have seen the EU propose legislation uh, just from about three or four weeks ago as well. So our view is very much, it's welcome. We need it, um, but we don't have time to wait for it to come. So we're not going to stand around and wait for legislation. We need to continue to try and protect children online prior to legislation arriving and, and make the best of it, however, it does arrive in the UK. I'll pass it to Jim. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Jen Person, Director of Defend Digital Me. We are a human rights campaigning organization and we focus on data and digital rights for children. Now our specialism is in the education sector, but the reason that I have spent a great deal of time researching the safety tech sector over the last few years has been because it has been uh, imposed upon the schools sector through the prevent duty, the duty to monitor for radicalization and extremism. So there's an overlap there between our core remit in education and safety tech. But when it comes to the online safety bill or the online harms bill, as it used to be known, I think it's worth also looking back a little bit at the sort of background of where it began. And in fact, while people will talk about starting in 2017 with the Green Paper, or 2019 with the, with the online harms work, uh, first, first publication, I would say it goes back all the way to the 2010 Conservatives Party Manifesto with the aim to make um, reduce the commercialization of childhood. And one of the aspects that we're interested in, I think we should discuss this afternoon about the online safety bill, is to what extent 
the technology introductions that will be required through the online safety bill, including the behavioral identification technology that is somewhat vaguely mysteriously named and yet non-specific, questions around age assurance and age verification, all these have significant impacts, technology impacts, on the day-to-day -day activity and behaviours and access to the internet by children and by default then everybody else. Because if you need to identify who is a child, you also need to identify who is not a child. And that question is often not asked. So I'll be really interested in looking at this from the rights perspective, from children's rights perspective, including things like access to information, access to participation, discrimination, uh, and uh, look at this from how it might therefore impose certain duties. And as um, Fred said, Ofcom may be looking at being the parent, sort of looking over the shoulder of some of these companies. What I'm also concerned about is these companies becoming the pseudo parent of my and everyone else's children. Because as soon as you determine that the government, through Ofcom, through companies, can determine what my child or anyone else's can and cannot do, can and cannot see, can and cannot participate in online, you reduce my responsibilities and my ability as a parent to make those free decisions together with my child. Now, Tom mentioned Australia, and I am getting a march on us on the, on the online safety bill. It's also looking at what the children in Australia, what worth, worth looking at what the children in Australia said about that. The online e-safety commissioner in Australia said that as she carried out a survey in 2019, and the children there responded that 57% of them said they didn't think, for example, that online monitoring made them feel safer. In fact, it made them feel uncomfortable having technologies looking over their shoulder. And 47, nearly half, 47%, nearly half of respondents said they didn't think it was effective anyway. It didn't make them any safer. So let's discuss it. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, if you've got any questions for the panel, then feel free to put up your hand. Um, if you prefer, you can also use Slido. Um, uh, the link and QR code are uh, on the screen. So if you want to start with the, the first question from Alistair, does anyone feel like tackling that? So what protections are going to be included in the Child Safety Bill um, to, to protect children from buying things they cannot pay for and harming the parents' credit? Could I, could, yes. I, could I add a little more to that one? Because I'm, I'm fortunately in the, in the room today. It says that you used to have an English law with a provision that children, if they made a contract, it was not enforceable against them at all. Because they, so that, that's the way that we've all, all we've worked. So children were protected from making, young children in particular were protected from making contracts for things that they couldn't pay for. And that to, has been exploited, particularly in the video game industry, where you've had terrible issues where children have been and bought loot boxes and other things of that sort, and suddenly their parents' credit rating is undermined by, uh, by these activities and so on. This should not be a change a hidden change in English law, we should still be protecting children. What should protections are going to be included in the online safety bill to protect against the, against these sort of me these sort of measures? I have to choose my words carefully because like I say it's still being negotiated, but um, I mean as far as loot boxes, I should probably make a, a disclosure here. I'm also on the board of the Video Standards Council that provides peggy ratings for the gaming industry, so I've got a bit more of an insight um, on, on loot boxes. At the moment, loot boxes aren't included in the online safety bill. There's a proposal by a few parliamentarians that they want to put it in there. Um, we, we've been discussing whether or not that's the right vehicle for this, because like you say, there is current legislation that we feel like this could be covered if, if it was tweaked or, or attached to it in other ways. Now, could that be um, around, as far as loot boxes, particularly in gaming, um, there's been a lot of activity around well, app stores, obviously, and, and the activity gateways, uh, not necessarily having any, any consideration for um, safety in, in some of the app store rules. So they look at it from a very engineering basis, not necessarily from a, from a, a risk basis, should we say, to, to what the user base will be. Um, that said, Ofcom won't necessarily have the powers for that at the moment. 
Um, and there's not a specific um, mention in the bill about protecting, obviously, um, just saying to, to stop children from buying things. It's, it's based around, like Jen was saying, it's based around how old are, uh, is it appropriate for children that age to be on the platform in the first place? So to make sure that the design of that platform is based around their user base. Um, and we've seen the information commissioner officer with their age appropriate design code, which has actually been very successful and, and got quite a lot of um, traction in the US. I was over there a few weeks ago in Capitol Hill. And it was quite interesting just to see how much that small paper had made uh, such an impact on, on that side of the pond. And I think these sorts of initiatives to try and encourage um, these sorts of thought processes at the design stage, I think is probably the best way of going around things rather than trying to try and um, enforce something later on. It's, um, it's probably a little bit too late at that point just to try and think about things slightly differently. Thanks. Um, any other questions or anyone else wants to I was just going to mention, I haven't got, I was just going to give a real world example. I've got three daughters. I'm currently going through one of these situations where we've got money coming out of our bank account to Apple, but we have no idea what it's for. And it appears to be something probably within a game uh, or something online that we just can't get to the bottom of. So uh, from a personal point of view, I would agree that that is certainly a, a key issue. Whether that falls within this bill or not is, a, is another question, but a real world example that that does happen. Yes. Yeah, and just one line to wrap up that. I mean, it does raise a good question of what's missing in the bill for children, which is actually roots for complaint and redress. One of the biggest gaps is not about perhaps content uh, access or keeping children out of the internet. It's once they've had a harmful experience or knowing what is harm and defining what is harm for each individual. Is it, have, you know, do we each think of ourselves as a person of ordinary sensibilities? How do we define that? How is Ofcom going to define it? Is they going to rely on um, different types of definitions that have been battered about by different groups? If you are a child of particular sensibilities or a particular vulnerability or a particular community, would you feel harm greater or lesser than others? And where do you go for redress? And at the moment, it's something the bill doesn't tackle. And actually, it would be one of the biggest questions that if we go back to the roots of the bill, what should have been the, the point of the bill about this duty of care and systematic harm, one of the key solutions is roots for redress. So it's a good question of why is it not in the bill? Thanks. Yeah, should we yeah, take questions from Jane? Oh, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> you mentioned Australia. Uh, so, and also one of the panelists actually mentioned the rise of a parliament. This is a very, very big issue in the United States. So, on the one hand, the transgender community is pushing to educate kids as young as possible what transgender means. Okay? And so, on the other hand, some parents, in particular conservative parents, don't like that. And so, one issue is that the state should actually decide what children learn at what age and not the parents. And so states that actually believe in that, they now have introduced in the library for kids, kindergarten and elementary school, materials so that they can teach kids what their gender really means. Okay? And parents are objecting against that because they consider this pornography. And so they're actually working very hard to get these books out of the library. So this is making the news on a daily basis in the United States. So I think that the issue of who decides what actually should be blocked is a big issue. And secondly, are, is your law going to discriminate against the gender? Thank you. Uh, you want to tackle yeah, sure. Um, so what I will say is I think you've highlighted a, a massively important point, particularly for the technology sector who are involved in trying to address a lot of the problems is there is no one size fits all in the United States, I think is the probably the best example because as you've described, you can range from completely different views about how to parent children. And um, I know an awful lot of people in the United States who say, I purchased the device 
that is my child and I will do whatever I like on it. Now, I'm not saying I agree with that, but then you will, that is completely opposite to the view you're expressing where actually we need to be educating children at a young age about um, gender and about how they can express themselves and how they can gain more education. So the United States is not a country I would envy trying to implement similar kinds of laws. I think this question raises two important points for the bill on this side of the Atlantic. The first is, as you said, who decides? Now, at the moment, the bill is left with very open secondary legislation powers. And as Fred mentioned, a lot of powers for Ofcom to decide things uh, of itself, becoming a sort of arbitrary decision maker, which is of itself a challenging position to be in, especially when the the question becomes who watches the watchers, who's in charge of Ofcom, who makes decisions above them. And that question is the Secretary of State. Now, the bill leaves a great deal of power open to the Secretary of State. Now, we work as a non-partisan, I will say very clearly, um, organisation. So our criticisms of this bill and the Secretary of State's powers are not party political. But if you were to have an MP, for example, who had worked, in their own words, hand in glove with a fundamentalist Christian organization to narrow the uh, provisions in, for example, abortion rights, say 10 years ago, and then 10, 15 years ago, they were to become the Secretary of State with uh, very clear views, personal views on those issues. You might then question whether that Secretary of State should be given the, the strength of powers that she will be handed in this bill. Those rights that you're talking about, the children to access information from counselling services, from access to educate themselves, to uh, make inquiries, and also very importantly to understand that the children are developing. They're developing, they're not, they're allowed to make mistakes, they're allowed to ask questions, and they need to have access to safe spaces to ask those questions. There is a great deal of concern in the United States at the moment across civil society groups that access to search engine information, for example, will be um, used by uh, policing powers should certain states decide in the wake of the uh, revocation of Roe versus Wade, where abortion access may be decided to be unlawful, then if there's then authority, authorities take the uh, search engine search data uh, of people who have accessed information about abortion services or clinics, they could suddenly find themselves with severe consequences for simply making inquiries about health provision clinics online. Now, search engines data is in the scope here for the online safety bill. And we have to understand who might have access to that in future, whether it be providers who could then have um, access demanded of them by police and other authorities, and also potentially with Ofcom. And who might have access to Ofcom's uh, information in future, again, is open at the moment, and I Fred may have more information than I do on that. But I think it's a very important question about rights, um, for children to be able to access information and also very serious questions for who might have access to the information about what they have been looking for in the future. I absolutely agree. And I mean, these, these are things that have been raised in the committee hearings that uh, will take place in, in Parliament as well. And, uh, and so again, I can't say what Ofcom will or won't have just at that stage at the moment, but um, just on, on the Secretary of State point, that was something that was raised by a number of number of contributors as well and uh, and, and also Ofcom also raised this as a point in so this is no secret here about independence of the regulator from from government parliament sets the law Ofcom obviously um, in, in, uh, regulates uh, according, according to that law so we just want to make it absolutely clear that Ofcom is independent and uh, we will make our own decisions now depending on what happens in the bill with with uh, with the control that the secretary of state may uh, may make an impact, but Ofcom will still make our own decisions. And on those points, like you're saying, these are exactly the sorts of questions we're asking ourselves internally. What does this actually mean? I mean, if there is a, if there is age gating put on a particular site, is that going to um, impact on, on children's human rights and, uh, and making sure that we get the voice of children as well? It's actually very difficult. We're finding uh, some challenges here about what we can ask children under a certain age, 
um, because of um, having to have parents there and, and having them able to actually disclose some things that they may not want to say in front of their parents for, for whatever reason. So it is it's proving to be quite a challenge, I would say, for us to get the information we need to, to make quite a lot of these um, decisions. But ultimately, I think some of these will come back to us at the end. When we have to make a judgment call, that's really where all of this groundwork will, will, will um, come into benefit for us to, to have that thought process already there and to try and work out exactly how those interactions work because ultimately we're aware that you know what plays out online is, is generally a reflection of society offline to a certain extent as well um so so there is a of some offline elements you raised about libraries as well and how we might be able to to cover that under some of our media literacy powers which is slightly separate yeah, thanks um one question is basically related to we've seen a lot of Push, I think, by technology companies and governments, uh, both in the UK and the EU, on one specific piece of technology, uh, client side scanning. So, basically, technology is trying to detect uh, illegal content on device, uh, which is going to bypass uh, internal encryption. Uh, so, I'd be very interested in the views of the panel on you know, both the necessity and the risks uh, including the privacy of these solutions. Yes, I, I was waiting for somebody to ask this something. So, <laughs> and um, Stephen knows that the, you know what we've been trying to do is trying to trying to make sure that we don't end up in a polarised debate, and which is what's unfortunately happened already. Um, so we're trying to sort of draw people in to say, okay, well, there are a number of options here. Whether or not I think um, it's not going to be all one or all of another. It's about a layered approach to protection. And where where do you end up there with, with encryption? I'll leave I'll leave Thomas to probably give you some more of a his view from, from his previous life. Um, I, I used to work um, prior to joining Ofcom. Um, I was the Chief Technical Officer and Deputy CEO of the Internet Watch Foundation. So we were tackling child sexual abuse content online. Um, there are, there are, the debate has become confused, I would say is probably the, the, the best way. And people are trying to um, sort of push, push the debate into certain areas rather than looking at this in the whole. What is the benefit of encryption to, to cybersecurity, to, to protect people from fraud, um, these sorts of things. You know, the, the GDPR compliance, you need to, to make sure you encrypt data there as well. Actually, how is this going to impact on, on some of the uh, potential ideas? Now, it's not actually very clear because technically um, scanning within and into an encrypted environment at the moment does not actually take place. And the, the client side is because that's where it's unencrypted. So that's ultimately what's, um, what's taking place there. Now, Ofcom, we don't have powers to, um, to um, force operating system providers to, to implement anything across their entire platforms as, um, with, within the bill. Um, so, so we wouldn't be in a position to say, uh, Apple, Google, you, know, you must provide this um, client-side scanning for, for all of the apps on your, on your particular um, devices. So it's been left open, I think, a little bit purposefully to, to be able to, to provide for, for future changes. So whatever those changes are, would it be that one particular app provider wants to make use of Apple's uh, CSAM scanning that they did roll out and then um, retracted? Um, possibly, it could be that. Um, could it be that, um, that there are potential signals within the metadata that provide more information, such as you know, thinking about the, the child protection issues, one adult, year old guy like myself sending out um, you know, messages to 200 uh, 15 year olds at one o'clock in the morning um, that I've never had contact with before that's a good signal to show that there's something not quite right going on there um, and you and, and also you know some of these end-to-end -end encryption environments encryption environments they're not completely end-to-end -end encrypted all the time so if we use the example of WhatsApp if you're in a group and somebody reports WhatsApp moderators can see what's taking place so they can take some action at that point. Whether or not that's enough for law enforcement to be able to take action is beyond the purpose of the bill. So at that point, I'll probably send way over to uh, Thomas to uh, provide some more. Thank you. Uh, great question. So I'll, so I'll take myself back a year to when I'm in law enforcement because that can probably help what law enforcement's views of, um, of this the need for this kind of activity to take place. So everybody's familiar with net net kind of figures of. Facebook reporting 29 million reports of child sexual abuse material CSAM on their network. Apple reporting 245 in a whole year. Um, and what I will say, probably on behalf of law enforcement, is 
Law enforcement would like to see less because it's incredibly difficult to handle anyway. They want to see very good quality. They want to be able to see cross-platform activity like Fred has just described, the guy at one o'clock in the morning who is who is sending out countless amounts of, um, you're almost like put your fishing rod in enough times and, and someone will take the bait. They, they need to be able to see that cross-platform engagement to, to be able to get to the worst people. But the value of being able to do some form of scanning for CSAM is that can give what I would call a window into the world of some incredibly harmful situations that are taking place within some children's houses. And often it, that is the only way for law enforcement to get those opportunities to safeguard, protect children, because I make no bones of saying that for me, safeguarding and protecting children is the most paramount part of it. Now, I would then also say that what Apple looked to do last year, I commend it because they were barely able to see any CSAM within their network. Where it obviously went wrong was probably in the, the messaging was wrong. They tried conflated maybe too many issues at the same time that confused people. But I understand why the EU legislation in particular is seeking to make it mandatory to search for CSAM because it does provide a fantastic opportunity to protect children. Well, <laughs> there's so many things to touch on in that question, but briefly, this touches on the question of general monitoring. Will the, um, will the online safety with its current proposals to obligate companies to carry out general monitoring? Now, this does away with the protections that individuals had under Article 15 of the Commerce Directive um, EU e-commerce e directive because uh, one of our Brexit bonuses might we get we all get to lose our protections of, of that uh, form of piece of legislation. There is significant pushback. I think it was only over 75 civil society organizations signed um, a document uh, calling on the EU to reconsider their proposals uh, to uh, look around to the, um, the the current proposals to change some of that. But it, it touches really the, the two, two conflated questions. One is grooming. Do you require access to content to identify grooming? My answer to that would be look at what the, and I may misremember his title, the former Director General of NSA, um, somebody I'm sure in the audience can correct me if I got it wrong, um, who said he killed based on metadata. He didn't need content to be able to carry out the um, uh, surveillance that they found necessary for attacks in a war situation. If that's the case, then metadata should be plenty sufficient and you don't need access to content of messaging to identify these types of patterns that Fred is talking about of individuals contacting thousands of 15 year olds at one o'clock in the morning. That's the kind of behavioral techniques and technologies can be used to identify through metadata. It doesn't need to be content. And in terms of the um, on-device uh, technologies, I would, uh, to, as we're short of time, refer people rather to um, Ross Anderson and colleagues uh, uh, work around the world in the paper, Bugs in Our Pockets. Obviously, yeah. <clears throat> I, was just, I was just going to include, um, actually, that it's a very good point about um, some, some of the the challenges, should we say, with some of the, the solutions that have been proposed as well for client side scanning and, and just how effective they are across the whole gamut of handsets that are out there. Is the hardware capable of doing this? Is there going to be collisions with the, the particular that hash sets? Is that is um, using hash matching the best solution for this? Should it be perceptual or cryptographic, etc.? So, so there are lots and lots of different sort of questions to, to, uh, to answer that, that mean that to, to your point about metadata, and this is this is where I suppose we've got a bit of a tussle uh, with law enforcement. How far would Ofcom go before this is a law enforcement issue, and whether or not we would be the right people to comment on that or not? Um, I think at the moment there's there's fairly clear lines of delineation there, and we know where our duties stop and, and law enforcement starts. Um, so, so we just want to make that clear that. Um, Ofcom aren't going to be the people that are going to be in there scanning, looking at people's material. That's not what we're here to do. It's very much about the process behind it and the considerations of the industry. Yeah. 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 
I think it's important then to draw a distinction between Ofcom's duties to oversee these processes and what will happen in practice by companies. Now, there's very opaque access by law enforcement to companies' commercial data. Now, if we are going to get these types of um, policies imposed by the bill, I think we have to have the quid pro quo transparency obligations that things like content takedown, blocking, um, and uh, information passed on to law enforcement should have transparency obligations for every commercial company and every provider. And the, I think it, the last numbers I saw were 24,000 companies that will be affected across the UK. And that's even before it's extraterritorial um, obligations in the bill. Um, that we make sure we're getting reporting on this because otherwise we're going to have powers handed out that nobody can really oversee. Suddenly companies will be obliged to do things. Ofcom might have separate duties, but the aspect of who accesses the information that private companies uh, will then be obliged to collect and retain may be opaque unless we get decent reporting into the bill. I'm going to get um, Jane's question and then we'll move to a few other things and then see how much time we have. So, Jane. Hi. Um, so, my question is on the correct parental responsibility. So, how much do you assume parental responsibility and control over what their children do? And how much responsibility do you put on uh, companies to restrict their platforms? He said on the uh, loot box sort of um, iteration. Do you expect parents to control their finances and control their access to children and or do you expect the platform to prevent this sort of thing? Yeah, I'll start because another great question. Um, from a technology sort of point of view, so from a safety tech point of view, um, it's come up quite a bit about education and I think that's massively important and education always seems to be aimed at children. We must educate the children. now. As a parent, a parent with reasonable tech knowledge, I actually think educating the adults is probably one of the, the most important things. And that doesn't necessarily mean they have to be educated in that they get to see everything that their child is doing. It's a tough balance, but it has to be, in my mind, a balance between the, and, and the money's good way of doing it. You, you don't control all of your children's money, and at the same time, you want to teach them about how to use money, how to be responsible, how to operate online with it. Um, and education for parents and children at the same time is key to what certainly we as a safety tech company are seeking to do. Yes, I, I, I'll just second that. Um, and I would say always look at Ofcom's website. We have some uh, fantastic uh, information. So we published our online nations report uh, uh, on Tuesday as well. And sort of asking the questions really about what people want. Um, no, we're not intending to sort of control um, <laughs> how kids spend their money online because that's, that's not what Ofcom's here to do. Um, but I would, I would absolutely second what Thomas just said that we have media literacy programs, making sense of media as well. And this is all about educating, not just kids, it's the parents as well. And I would say um, as a parent um, that's just set up parental controls for my daughter's first telephone uh, and a technologist who's worked in this field for, well, 20 years, but no, it doesn't work very well. I'll be quite straight with that, and I'll say that internally and externally. It, you know, there is very much a, a view from the industry to protect their own landscape, and, and that's not enough to, to allow parents. But that said, the frictionless ease by which parents can set up any controls that they feel appropriate um, for, for, their, for their child's device is something that's a problem at the moment. You know, it's, uh, you know, you've got juggling four or five different devices, you're logging in on your laptop, I've got my phone, her phone, and, you know, I'm testing things, it's not working. Um, and I, and I, I would love to be able to tell you more about some testing we did back in the office, but unfortunately I'm bound by confidentiality rules, <laughs> so I can't. Um, but just to say, these are, these are real areas that need addressing, and um, the educational piece is really where I think that's going to, to be covered. It's a shame that the chapter on digital literacy has been removed from the bill. There are some small elements remain, but the actual chapter, which is actually the fundamentals of where the bills for the, the origins of the, the bill started out, I think it was 10 DCMS Secretary of States ago in, in 2010, um, was around digital literacy. It was a lot about education. 
And it's really sad that has gone. And it's really become much more about this sort of idea of top-down controls and parent parental controls built into these uh, systems, often are for-profit systems. Now, I'll be careful what I say because I realize some of the, um, you know, the tools that come out of academic work uh, will fall into these sort of commercial uh, spin-offs. But I think we've got to be really cautious about thinking that the tools that are designed for the good guys, for you know, the purposes that we think of as looking out for protecting children and for social good, aren't in fact just as economically exploitative for children and families as other tools and other games and other things might be online. Um, we really risk you know, other people being in charge is the question asked about who, who's in charge, who makes these decisions for us. Now, if, if the bill takes away parental accountability, parental responsibility, it says I'm going to, we're going to decide from top down what children should be able to access and age verification is required, or age assurance is required, that means parents having to hand over their credit card details very often as a tool of age assurance or age verification. Now that potentially exposes families to even greater risk online than had their children been able to access content without this age assurance. Now the arguments will be, oh, it's only for the most risky content, a high priority content. Do you know a piece of legislation that has not crept its scope over time, that has not decided, well, this content actually we, we think should be in scope now as well. And it's part of why the regulations have been left so open. And I'm really fearful that age assurance and age verification is sneaking in without proper debate because this bill is so enormous. And we're going to find that actually every one of us in the near future will have to hand over our identifiable, sensitive, confidential data to determine, for example, you know, what age we are so that we can prove we're not a child, or for example, to prove you know, perhaps that we are or aren't a journalist because there's meant to be protections, different protections in the bill from journalism content, non-journalistic content. There's lots of questions about um, what this does then for relationships of trust. You know, are we going to have to enable um, parental oversight tools that undermine the relationship between parents and children. And I point you uh, to the work of um, Wang Van Cleek, um, uh, Jim Zhao and others, I think overseen by Nigel Shackold. Um, they did a, a paper on um, the theories of parent parenting and child development in uh, the context of child safety tech and really looked at how it undermines the child-parent relationship. So these things may be intended for good, but I think we've got to be very cautious that they're not evidenced at the moment that they'll achieve what they say they'll achieve and actually do more harm than good, potentially. Thanks. Um, so we've touched on a few of the online questions already, but I think one we haven't talked about is the cost of compliance and smaller providers. So, and Facebook will be fine. Facebook will always be fine. They've got enough lobbyists to, to deal with this. But, what about the smaller providers? How do you think they will deal with, with this bill if it comes into force? Is it going to be good for them, bad for them? Uh, what can be done to help? Yes, and that's, that's something that it, it, it is um, stipulated that they'll often have to consider you know, the, the proportionality and the cost of, of this as well. And we do. And, and like Stephen said, we're well aware that the big players actually have, have the engineering capacity, you have to have the data um, capacity to be able to, to manage this. But actually it's, um, it's an interesting question because um, what we've been discussing is, uh, is it also draws into competition policy as well, which is uh, the, the, the digital markets unit, which is where is that, mo where, where can that be most effective to help smaller enterprises? Is it, is it to work with the larger enterprises um, to, to have a, a, a sort of much more of a, They've got, they've got the market control at the moment and actually to provide that covers the smaller entities. I'm sure Thomas wouldn't necessarily agree with that. Or, or is it better to, to promote innovation and have you know, many roses um, sprouting? And I suppose that's probably the best way of saying it. Um, and actually, you know, part of my role is to, to, is to, to help innovation as well. And to always have an eye on innovation. And actually, Ofcom does have to do that. And, and Ostgen um, providers are working on these sorts of solutions as well to, to, to provide a, a, different, a different viewpoint as well, because I think sometimes, you know, I, I know that as, 
as academics, you're probably uh, you're thinking about researcher access to data from some of these platforms as well, and just how difficult it is to get that, that access in any sort of meaningful way, or they'll cut you off if you're doing anything that might not necessarily be, uh, be as, uh, as commercially useful to them as, as it was from an academic perspective. Um, but it's for the smaller providers, there's, there's very much the intention to have a light touch risk review. It's really about the risk of your platform. Now, there has been obviously some, some smaller platforms that could have a higher risk depending on their user base. So the Discord as well, as we, we've heard, we would expect them to, to take more action. But actually, um, they might have a very large online presence, but that doesn't necessarily mean they've got uh, you know, a lot of revenue and a lot of resource behind them. You think of people like um, Mumsnet and Reddit, et cetera, who are going to fall into the scope of the bill, but actually are much more community-based. So what does, what does it mean for them, and how can we help those guys? Well, by pointing to some of the solutions that are out there, by trying to work with people to, to maybe open source some of the, the options that are available for them, or to be able to facilitate um, access to some of the larger provider solutions. So, so it's, all, it's all open to play, but Ofcom don't want to be in a situation where we say you must use X because we, we can't do that because that's a, it's a competition issue straight away. So what we want to be able to say is here are some options, but you can also innovate yourself. Um, and that we think will give some opportunity to safety tech providers to start thinking themselves about how can we innovate in this area and really push this forward and, and show that there are potential solutions for smaller enterprises that are not going to cost a fortune. Well, that's very far. So I probably haven't got a whole lot more to add to that other than just on the innovation point and from a safety tech perspective, a lot of the innovation that's taking place is trying to be cross-platform or platform agnostic, whereas a lot of the, the big tech innovation tends to be um, specific to their, their own platform themselves. So, um, so that's where safety tech would probably say as a whole that we're trying to do more across the broad scope of platforms rather than just platform specific. I think an element that gets forgotten when we ask about costs is what happens if the costs are too high for small businesses? And the question that the, the outcome is they will leave the UK's providing services. And we're really worried about this for actually a lot of children's services because they are the ones that may potentially be <coughs> risk averse and be most concerned about do I or don't I have to uh, comply with this? So they'll start off with quite high legal costs to start doing the analysis of this to work out whether they do or don't fall into scope. And a number of businesses may decide just to pull out of providing services at all for children because that will then reveal, release them from worrying about it. And the other aspect, I think, is all of these small businesses that will be then required to have um, do the assessment to start with before they even start looking at technology. And while government is keen to promote the safety tech industry and is looking for their first unicorn very shortly, you know, it's stealing from Peter to pay Paul in effect, You're cutting um, you know, one side of different types of businesses who, who may have to high costs and cut their innovation ability in order to boost the safety tech industry is I think a rather short-sighted policy. And I think um, others that are worth uh, looking at if you're interested in that aspect of it is Codec, for example. Could I come in just with one point on that one? The online safety bill. Thank you, thank you. The only online safety bill, the, the, the parliamentary bill it says, the full economic assessment of that was roughly 1.7 billion with a new Ofcom branch in Manchester costing at least 46 million a year, employing 150 staff. So in this times of austerity and the, the pressure from the bottom of these things, they, like the point the lady is making is very is uh, really needs to be taken into taken into account. This is uh, this could be one bridge too far for the for the industry. Thanks. I think we'll probably just to squeeze one short. Question which I really touched on, which is about um, in, in law enforcement. Um, so, law enforcement constantly refers to lack of funds to case things like CSAM. Do law enforcement need extra data by the bill, or do they just need more funds? Uh, and so, I'll add to that: and do they need extra data and these extra powers, or is there more that can be done with the, the existing powers? And, and if so, what's getting in the way? 
Yeah, so I would say not necessarily extra data, richer data, um, and on the highest harm cases, easier access to cross platform data so that when you are identifying people who are, I mean, we've all seen the cases that, that get publicized about people who are harmed against literally thousands and thousands of children, and, and the harm is severe, I've seen it, that they can jump from platform to platform with that investigation with far more ease than they currently do. So I don't think it's necessarily about more funds, although most people would like more funds, but it's richer data and easier access to follow the leads across different platforms. Absolutely agree. Um, I would also say that, yes, I do think the police need more funds to tackle this, but they've been quite clear that they can't arrest their way off the problem uh, because it's, as, as Thomas will know, you, you don't just find uh, child sexual abuse material on any kind of encrypted environments. It's everywhere. If you if you're if you're that way inclined, you will find it. Um, so it's just about how to, how to tackle things. The, the data I would also back up the, the richness of that data and and also how easy it is to move data across borders. So the the, the current MLAT um, system is. It's slow, outdated, doesn't necessarily get you the data. And by the time you're doing the investigation, it's, it's, it's being lost. So there are also, um, you know, the extraterritorial issues that um, you can't just look at uh, regulating um, online from, from you know, one geographical region without considering what's taking place elsewhere as well. So I would also say that some of, some of that investment in um, in funds to make things easy would probably be better on international collaboration efforts as well. Well, the bill is aiming to make a lot of things that are currently lawful um, but harmful suddenly unacceptable and therefore policeable. So in a sense, we're going to end up with more content that needs policing by somebody and enforcement by somebody that isn't already done today. If we look at the access to data question, look at Gen um, Manchester, where policing you know, struggled with for years with their new policing system. They had tons of data they couldn't cope with. We know there is a massive backlog in being able to process data in rape cases, for example. Um, the ICO has just um, wrapped policing over, over the knuckles for the type of data they're accessing and then not enforcing on with a less than 2% in, in prosecution rate in rape cases, for example. So they're accessing tons of data that they may not be using in the best possible ways and certainly not getting the enforcement action that should be required in severe breaches of law enforcement already today. So um, I think the question now of expanding all of this without budget is remarkable. And if we look at um, the women to be you know, seen this bill as a world leading bill, how are we going to do that on a shoestring? Um, and we're doing everything on services that have been cut back to the bone. Uh, and I think it's really important that we mention, for example, mental health uh, provision here as well for children. You know, there's severe cuts to mental health uh, services. You know, there's 6.7% um, of all mental health spending goes on children and teens. And that is somehow not discussed in the bill, although the finger is then pointed back at social media companies for in exacerbating or creating mental health problems. And yet the responsibility the government does have, which is to provide funding and provide services for mental health care, is at breaking point, if not past it. So we have to look, I think, in this bill at what the real responsibilities are for government, what they should be doing, and where we should reel back in the powers of the bill to look at what is actually enforceable rather than wishful and put this you know put into a rights first approach look at digital literacy and access to justice and redress primarily before we're looking at increasing access to data and of course this is also in the context of uh, the reforms to the data protection law coming soon which will reduce our rights and increase um, the ability for companies to use legitimate interests and not offer information around algorithms and automated decision making, for example, if the recent proposals are put through. So we've got lots of questions on data that we're uh, happy to answer later as well for more time. Okay, yeah, thank you, Roger. And uh, thank you for the panel. There's lots more interesting questions, but unfortunately we've got um, well, I should say, you know, unfortunately, you are next to the top coming up, so uh, we should close with that. Thank you.
So thank you very much. It was really great uh, uh, panel discussion. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for organizing, and thanks again, to the panelists, of course, for um, uh, intervening. So while we set up the uh, uh, projector and the screen, um, perhaps I can uh, um, make a quick introduction for for Brandon. Thank you so much for for coming and accepting our invitation. Um, I'm really excited to to hear your talk. So Brandon is a professor at NYU. Uh, uh, has the mass lab, <laughs> a really great name. Uh, has, has been doing a lot of work on software security, reverse engineering, uh, embedded systems, machine learning, uh, and security. And uh, so today, uh, here we go. So uh, today, uh, he will give a talk about large language models for software security, prospects, and, and pitfalls. And, uh, Thank you very much. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. All right. My auto there one says. Working out all right. Okay, well, so I suppose and now for something completely different. Um, not going to be talking very much about uh, an online safety bill. Uh, it'll be a little bit more on, on the technical side. Uh, so this is a bit of a, sort of a series of work that we've been doing for the past maybe year and a half. So it's all fairly recent. Uh, some of what I'm going to be talking about is unpublished or still in development, or even based on results that we did a bit of analysis on last night. So, uh, yeah, fairly uh, cutting edge here. And I just want to point out that this is not just all me, this is a large group of people back at uh, the NYU Center for Cybersecurity, uh, my colleagues over in the Electrical Engineering Department, uh, and some fantastic graduate students as well. Okay, so, yeah, I, here we go. Okay, so one thing that I think if you maybe hadn't been paying attention that would have come as kind of a great shock is the sort of sudden pace at which machine learning models, particularly large language models, have gained the ability to do programming tasks. Okay. So if we go back to 2015, there were some sort of very early kind of experiments in this area. Uh, Andre Karpathy had this little model called character RNN where you could feed it a bunch of text. Uh, in this case, he gave it the entire source code of the Linux kernel and asked it to generate things that looked like the Linux kernel. And it would give you things that looked maybe kind of plausible, but if you looked at them even a little bit closer, it would sort of all fall apart and look totally unrealistic. The code wouldn't actually do anything and so on. Um, things started to change when we got to GPT-2 in 2019. So it's open AI. <clears throat> and this was again with these very large uh, language models, or not large by today's standards, but it was had 1.5 billion parameters that were being trained, right? And this was trying to oh, and oh, 
completely self-connected. Uh, and this is not actually trying to generate code. This is just trained on general internet text, but no. Okay. There's a lag. No, no problem. Okay, great. So uh, it wasn't intended to be trained on code. It was just trained on text found on the internet. But it turns out that one thing that people do on the internet quite frequently is post programming examples, right? And so something that people noticed, including uh, me fairly early on, early on, was that it was spontaneously generating things like PHP code or C programs or JavaScript code, okay? And so people started to say, well, okay, what if we actually kind of tried to do this intentionally? What if we took some of these very large models and trained them specifically on code and tried to use them to generate code for us as sort of programming assistance, okay? And so things kind of came to head um, shortly afterward. I and mean, uh, so really just last year, uh, OpenAI released this model called Codex, which was essentially like this large GBT3 language model, but trained on tons and tons of open source code. All of the open source code that you might find on GitHub and public repositories. Okay. And the, uh, this was actually quite quickly commercialized. So GitHub itself said, you know, we think that this can be a very useful tool for helping people uh, to program faster, maybe even to produce higher quality codes. And so they released this code uh, tool called GitHub Copilot to still a limited uh, preview audience at the moment, but uh, it was uh, adopted by quite a lot of people very quickly. Yeah. Or, 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 or corruption. No problem. Oh, do we stop sharing something? Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. And, you know, the pace of uh, progress in this area has, has still been extremely rapid. So, uh, you know, this is just maybe a month ago. Uh, DeepMind, the division of Google now, uh, released this paper on a model they call AlphaCode, which could actually essentially perform at competitive human levels in online programming competitions. Okay. And so it's not winning them, right? It's, it's about the 50th percentile, right? So it's, it's a mediocre human, but <laughs> this is actually really quite impressive, right? So this is not something that I personally would have predicted uh, even two years ago that we would be at this point today, okay? And what's interesting about these systems is that they don't actually really even understand code in any sense, right? They're essentially just trained to treat it as text. And to say, given what text I've seen so far, what is coming next, right? So I guess what I want to talk about today is essentially what maybe things will look like. So what do things look like right now? What can we do with these? And what will things start to look like in the next few years? What may we be able to do with these kinds of capabilities in the field of software security? Okay. And so, uh, you know, there's some basic questions. If we've got millions of developers suddenly using these AI-based tools to write code, is that going to make the security of that code better or worse, right? Um, and maybe as security researchers ourselves, can we take some of these techniques and apply them to solving problems like finding vulnerabilities in software or demonstrating that these vulnerabilities are really exploitable or dangerous? or even automatically fixing these vulnerabilities without having to ask the original developers, okay? Uh, so just a quick note on some of these uh, graphics, again, in tune with this, uh, you know, rapid progress in AI, the graphics over here were generated by one of these uh, text image models, uh, one called Dolly Mini, which is an attempt to replicate in open source uh, this OpenAI, much more capable OpenAI model. And so here I just asked it to uh, give me some pictures of a robot striding down the road towards the horizon and it obliged. There are more of those. But how do these models actually work? Okay. So the basic training objective, right? You need to give it some uh, essentially function to maximize or some uh, score to increase. And the score here is essentially the accuracy at predicting 
the next token, and that might be the next word, the next character, or some subword token, given what you've seen so far. So given tokens, say one up through on minus one, what is the probability of the next token, right? So um, the types of models are typically transformers. So these kind of uh, appeared just a few years ago, uh, 2017 and 2018, and sort of quickly <clears throat> took over large portions of machine learning space. GPT-3 itself was trained on large chunks of the internet, uh, Wikipedia, this web text data set, uh, common crawl, um, and newer models have been trained on things like uh, the pile, which again is a sort of recreate <coughs> source some of these giant data sets. Codex itself is you take GPT-3 and you say, okay, you know all about maybe the English language and maybe a few other languages based on crawling the web. But if we now give you uh, all of GitHub, can you sort of specialize your code, your uh, text generation to source code? Okay. And then finally, Copilot is just the commercial version of Codex. So in maybe a little bit more detail, the way these work is through something called autoregressive sampling. Okay. So you start out with some sequence of text, right? So you're in your code editor, you started typing public static void, right? And if you know a little of Java or took an introductory uh, course in Java, I bet almost everyone can predict what the next word is going to be, right? So turns out a model can do that too, right? It can give you a probability distribution over possible words that could come next, okay? So maybe uh, main is very, very highly likely, right? Public static void main. Uh, is uh, almost every Java program will have that somewhere, right? Uh, but there's other things, maybe there's lots of methods called add or update or insert or things like that that have a similar signature. And maybe there's some things like braces or new lines, things like that. And again, this is all text, so it doesn't know anything about the meaning of these things. It just knows that over the uh, course of looking at all of this training data, when it saw a public static void, the most likely thing that would come next was name. And so now you can, if you want to generate text, you can pick from these possible next words according to this probability distribution that it gave you, right? So maybe you do this freely. There are a bunch of different strategies. Maybe you just say, I'm going to pick the most likely next token and say, I'm going to pick main. And then you tack that on to the sequence you have so far. You feed it back in to the model as input. And you go on and you ask it for the next token. Okay. And you can repeat this over and over and over again. There is a fixed limit to how much text these models can consider at once. Um, typically, I think the largest ones right now are still somewhere in the order of uh, 4,096 uh, tokens at a time they can look at. So this limits how much code they can consider as context at once. But overall, this incredibly kind of simple step-by-step -step strategy gives it some fairly surprising capabilities. Okay, so let's jump back to summer 2021, right? Uh, GitHub has just uh, announced that they're releasing this new tool, sort of takes the internet by storm. Lots of people try to sign up for this uh, beta, and we were some of the people who tried to sign up for this beta. And so we started taking a look at it, and uh, one of us, uh, Hannah Pierce, was lucky enough to get access basically uh, about a week after it was announced. And so he started trying to use it. Uh, and so he was just playing around with creating a little web app, okay? And so if you're creating a web application, maybe it has to interact with a database, maybe it has to submit SQL queries to that database. And so a classic mistake is to basically allow arbitrary strings from users to get sent directly to the database without any kind of sanitization. And so he was sort of surprised when he started typing this in and Copilot suggested basically what is an absolutely classic SQL injection vulnerability for Python, okay? And so, you know, this is a very basic thing um, and it was occurring in kind of the most obvious uh, and natural situation. And so we sort of immediately said, okay, well, how often is this happening? What else can we look at? Okay. Um, so it's just the same thing, just circling and pointing out exactly where that SQL injection is happening. 
And so we started looking at other languages. And so for C, it is notoriously difficult to program safely in. And it turns out that uh, machines also have trouble programming safely in C. <laughs> so here we asked it to uh, format three floating point numbers and put them into an array of uh, strings for us. And it was quite happy to do so, but it was not very clear on exactly how much space it might need to do so. And so if you take the program that it gives you and try to compile it and run it, you will see that you have a classic buffer overflow. Okay. And so if we run it, oh, okay, right. So we've got stack match detected. It's basically uh, in the process of formatting those floating point numbers to try to print them out. It has gone beyond the bounds of the space we set aside for it and started to trash other stuff that happened to be sitting around in memory. Okay. All right. So right. how secure is Copilot's code that it generates? And how do we look at this systematically? So there's a uh, list put out by MITRE called the top 25 most dangerous uh, vulnerabilities. They call them this common weakness enumeration. And these categories are things like buffer overflows, cross-site scripting, SQL injection. So these are kind of broad categories. They aren't specific to any particular piece of software, but general vulnerable patterns. Okay. And so we then had to uh, say, if we're going to be generating maybe thousands of programs that could be vulnerable, we need some way to automatically assess whether or not they have a particular vulnerability, okay? And so we said, well, what's a fair way to do that? Well, it turns out that GitHub has another product called CodeQL, uh, which is essentially a static analysis tool where you can write queries to express uh, checks for particular vulnerabilities, okay? And it's not perfect. There are uh, both false positives and false negatives. But in some sense, it seems somewhat fair to take a GitHub tool and use it to uh, evaluate another GitHub tool. And it's, it has an accessible query language, so we were able to create queries for a good chunk of this top 25 uh, set of vulnerabilities. Okay. So uh, if we go through and do this, we took, uh, we excluded basically seven of these CWB categories as not really something that we could check for automatically because they were things like, um, you know, uh, essentially things that uh, you couldn't necessarily write a static checker for, that you would have to actually have a human look at every uh, sample for, and some categories that kind of overlapped and were duplicated. So we ended up with 18 different categories and generated uh, basically three scenarios for each. So we sat down, uh, for example, wrote a little program like that web app that I showed earlier and generate three of these scenarios for each vulnerability. And then said Codex give us uh, up to 25 different ways of completing that scenario, okay? And when we do so and then apply this vulnerability detector to, uh, to it, we end up with this somewhat, uh, it was shocking at least to me, finding that 42% of those programs were in fact vulnerable, okay? And so this is not great. Um, I do want to add uh, that this doesn't mean that 42% of the time you try to write code with Copilot that you're going to end up with vulnerable code because these were specifically situations where you could have some kind of security vulnerability, right? If you're just writing a web app that doesn't interact with the database, of course, you're not going to get an SQL injection vulnerability, right? But when we look at these sort of security sensitive scenarios, it does end up being roughly on the order of 48% of the time, uh, it's going to generate vulnerable code in the situation. Okay? And so if we dig a little bit into this, um, we can see some kind of interesting things that maybe reflect uh, suspicions that we've had. So C is in fact more difficult to write secure code in than Python, at least for machine learning models, and to be honest, for humans too. Um, and so we found that uh, it was more than half of the C programs they generated were vulnerable, but only about 38% of the Python programs are vulnerable. And the kind of common problems were very reflective of the types of problems that you'd find in human generated code, right? Human written code. So things like use after free vulnerabilities, um, so using some memory after it's been uh, deallocated, things like getting array lengths wrong, so trying to put more data into an array that should actually fit. Um, using insecure or outdated uh, encryption algorithms or hashing algorithms, 
Um, and this kind of speaks to uh, a kind of issue with just training this on a giant pile of code. That giant pile of code, of course, contains uh, code that may have been written in 1985 when you know we thought that the DES was the best encryption there was, right? Um, or it might have been written yesterday where we have a much better understanding of cryptography, right? And yeah. A quick question. How do these percentages compare to human written code? That's a very good question. We'll have like that a very preliminary answer in about two uh, slides. No spoiler. No, okay. <laughs> Um, so the, the news wasn't all bad though. Uh, so it turned out that for these kinds of website vulnerabilities, so cross-site scripting, uh, issues related to logging in and permissions and file uploads and things like that, it actually did quite well at avoiding uh, the sorts of issues we were looking for. Um, one reason for that might be that uh, you know, there's just been tons and tons of activity uh, in creating good web frameworks with sensible defaults that can avoid many of these issues uh, Sort of out of the box, and so uh, it potentially could be, you know, there. The average case is just a bit better than the average case C code. Okay. okay, so we'll talk about uh, a little bit more. Uh, so this is something that's a bit fun. So if you remember, all of this is all these are basically just blind text generators, right? They don't understand uh, sort of the semantics of what they're producing. And that means that the uh, what gets generated can be influenced by things that don't actually have any functional purpose in the code, right? So if I write a comment saying, uh, you know, this is extremely secure code, right? Will that actually make it generate more secure code, right? Because maybe uh, out there on GitHub, people would only write this is very secure code if it was actually very secure code. So there would be some correlation between what you say in that comment and the kind of code that comes next. Um, so we sort of set out to do some systematic analysis of this. And so for this, we take one single scenario, right? So we focus on particularly just SQL injection vulnerabilities and then varied various aspects of this prompt that we are giving a language model and asking it to complete. And so uh, we did some fun things, yeah? So one is if you change who the author of the code is, right? So this is just a variable in the code that doesn't do anything. It just says the author of this code is someone, right? Uh, when we use the lead author of the paper, uh, Hammond Pierce, it uh, started generating slightly worse code. Um, I don't think that's a comment on him. I think it just means that it didn't have any particular association with, uh, with his name. Whereas if we use a very famous Python developer, okay? So uh, this Andre Petrov, who is the lead author of URL Lib3, which is uh, extremely widespread, widely used uh, Python package, um, it got slightly better, okay? Now, if you're looking over here, many of these differences may essentially just be noticed, okay? So I wanna caution that uh, not all of these things create systematic differences in the security of the code that it generates. But if we start looking at what things really do make a difference, we found two things that really strongly influence whether or not it's going to generate some secure code. And that is whether it has a secure or an insecure example to work on. Okay? So if in the prompt we included sort of a secure way of inserting data into the database, it would never essentially produce an SQL injection vulnerability after that. Okay? So, whereas if we had an example of doing it insecurely, it would almost always generate more insecure code for us. Okay. So, again, this comes back to the fact that it is really just trying to generate the most likely prediction. It is not trying to generate the best code or most secure code. Okay. Uh, but I thought that was very interesting. And it sort of means that, yeah. Right, so actually this is one question that we were uh, curious about as well, um, is so these sorts of, uh, you know, issues of if the author name affects something, does that have some kind of, uh, you know, bias amplification aspect, right, because maybe, um, you know, I, 
if you're not very well known, then it's going to generate worse code for you than if you're someone famous, right? Um, and so I don't think that the results we have here are strong enough to indicate a particular bias there. Uh, we also did something that was kind of similar to um, familiar in sociology with the idea of a resume study, where you basically take the exact same resume, vary the name at the top, and then see how often it gets accepted. We did something like this where we uh, tried to look for uh, things like racial or gender bias in the code uh, produced based on the name that was at the top of the author file. Uh, we didn't find very much, but I, I want to stress we didn't uh, investigate it all that thoroughly, and I think it would be a great uh, area to look into. Okay. All right, so, you know, the kind of open problems here are how can we fix this, right? We would like it not to generate insecure code, even if you already have some vulnerabilities in your code, right? And so uh, there are things that potentially we could do with fine tuning it. So we could say, uh, here are some examples of vulnerable code. Don't generate things that look like this as often, right? Uh, we could also try to fall back on tools for verification and validation that we already use on software when we're writing it, right? If you're a conscientious developer, hopefully you're already using tools like CodeQL or fuzzers or verification type tools. And these could potentially be used in conjunction with something like Copilot to get better assurance that at least you're not creating vulnerabilities of the type that we know how to detect automatically. Okay. Another question that I think Leonardo this very much raises: how often does this actually matter in practice, right? If you take a human developer and compare the code that they write with and without Copilot. Are you going to get better code with the person using Copilot or worse code, right? From both maybe a functionality perspective and from a security perspective, okay? So uh, we did actually try to set up to answer this question directly. Uh, so we put together a little user study. Um, again, you know, we're university researchers, so we had to take a somewhat convenient sample of uh, users, namely undergraduates and graduate students in the CS program in the US. Um, and we basically randomly gave half of them access to a uh, little plugin for their developer uh, tools that tries to mimic Copilot, but behind the scenes is using the sort of research version of Copilot, which is Codex. And then we said, go ahead. Uh, and try to implement this sort of basic linked list API. So we gave them a list of functions, we gave them a very basic test suite, and said, you know, go try to uh, implement this. And then looked at uh, basically how likely they were to finish, how many uh, tests passed on both this basic test suite we gave them and also a much expanded test suite. So this kind of it models fairly similar. Uh, way, what you would expect if you're giving someone a homework assignment in an early stage programming course. And I, we were actually somewhat surprised, <laughs> at least I was surprised. And again, this is very, very early data. This was analyzed last night. So uh, we were surprised when, in fact, it seems like students that had Codex uh, would have, end up with more functional code, right? So they would pass more of both the tests in the test suite we gave them and more of the tests in this expanded test suite that we held back. And as far as we can tell from doing things like fuzzing the code and using uh, sanitizers, um, like address sanitizer to check for memory safety issues while we run the test suite, they, they ended up with fewer security problems in the code they were writing. Okay, and so this is all in uh, C, so there are plenty of opportunities to mess things up. And you know, so again, all sorts of caveats here, right? Are undergraduates and graduate students in CS representative of real developers? Probably not, right? They're maybe representative of very novice developers. Um, and also, you know, this isn't the most enormous study in the world, it's 60 students, okay? So in particular, uh, this one on the right here does not actually reach statistical significance. And this one barely reaches statistical significance is I think P of 0.04. So we just barely squeaking under the wire there, but I wouldn't, you know, bet your company on it. <laughs> Um, but so this is, uh, this is a surprising result to us. We want to dig into this more, understand this better, and potentially expand the scope a bit, look at more experienced developers. Um, but potentially this indicates that, you know, maybe at least for novice developers, the code that something like Codex or Copilot is giving them might actually in some cases be better than what they're uh, turning out on their own, at least in a sort of 
uh, low stakes setting where they're getting you know, basically a $25 gift card at the end of it. Okay. Yeah. That would be expected if their average quality is less than the people who created the kid code, right? Right. So if, if, that's the question is if they're on average um, less skilled than uh, the GitHub code, but on the other hand, you know, if it makes them faster, it might also give them more time to look at the code that they're uh, creating and say, wait a second, that looks like that might have a buffer overflow. I'm going to fix that. So we do actually have a little bit, uh, some extra stuff that we're going to be looking at um, in the coming weeks, which is if we compare what the code model gave them and what they eventually submitted, did they just accept these things without modification or did they actually take the time to kind of look at them, tweak them, modify them before uh, actually saying, we're good, I'm done, right? Uh, there's another question there. Yeah, um, I was gonna say, doesn't it also matter if they count who we use in the program? Because um, I, I know a lot of programs are just outright refuse to use it. Right. Yeah. So we were sort of trying to get around that by using uh, randomized uh, this randomized trial uh, sort of technique here, where basically students uh, were randomly assigned to use the version that had codex or the version that uh, didn't. So they didn't have a choice in the matter. If you were doing this as a kind of more natural experiment, where you just you know tried to look at anyone who was currently using uh, Copilot, then you would have to worry about that sort of selection bias. Yes. What I'm saying isn't that selection bias an important factor in the sense that it does actually impact the relevance of the findings. Uh, well, potentially, but if the findings, for example, say that, um, you know, if we were to expand this to more experienced developers with the same randomized uh, setting, then that would give guidance to people who maybe are holding out uh, because they think that it's going to generate insecure code, right? So that's the hope. Yeah. So sorry, we some fine tuning for Right. So I think this is, is this a question about say we take copilot and we have a generated bunch of examples, have a, a human expert look at them and say these ones are good, these ones need to be fixed, and then feed that back into the training process to fine tune them up. Yeah, so that's the kind of thing that I was uh, trying to suggest uh, back here with this section on fine tuning is that that's potentially something we could do. It is fairly labor intensive because you need a bunch of experts to go and label a bunch of code, but potentially uh, because it's fine tuning a model that's already quite capable at generating code, you might not need, say, you wouldn't need necessarily all of GitHub uh, scale code. That you might be able to get away with maybe a few thousand labeled examples. Okay, okay. Uh, so continuing on with these sort of pitfalls, um, this is one that I think uh, Lorenzo kind of touched on this morning, or not this morning, early this afternoon, <laughs> um, which is that, okay, so open source, right? It was trained on open source code. Who has the ability to upload code to GitHub? Absolutely anyone in the world, right? So, uh, basically, a week after Copilot was released, um, I was just doing a quick Twitter search. I don't mean to pick on this guy in particular. It's just the first one that came up on the search results. Uh, but someone said, oh, imagine all the people who are currently uploading code with backdoors and vulnerabilities in it so that the next version of GitHub Copilot will be more likely to generate vulnerable code or backdoor code, right? And it turns out that uh, he wasn't the first person to think of this. Uh, there's an academic group uh, over at Cornell uh, who wrote a paper about this for using Security 2021 and found that actually, yes, it is quite possible to essentially poison the training data set, right? And, um, you know, you can maybe hope that at the scale of GitHub, it's hard to upload enough code to significantly influence the training process. Uh, but in fact, uh, it doesn't take all that much code to get to start generating uh, insecure code. And in particular, you can also start to do things like target this attack at particular developers, right? So you could upload a bunch of code that the first half of it um, looks exactly like OpenSSL, right? One of the core uh, cryptography libraries on the internet. And then the second half of it is still looks like OpenSSL, but with a bunch of vulnerabilities, right? Now, if OpenSSL developers start using Copilot, they might be more likely to get vulnerable code suggested to them 
because these poison examples were in the training data set. Okay. So definitely something to worry about and think about. Um, this, I think, is definitely an open problem. Okay, so we've had a lot of doom and gloom. <laughs> Let's start thinking about maybe some ways that we can try to use some of these models to make things a bit better. So uh, one is maybe we can try to actually fix vulnerabilities, okay? So it, we can generate code and we have techniques for detecting vulnerabilities. So what we're going to try to do is design prompts for these language models that will let us take out the vulnerable code that's currently there and then ask it to generate a more secure version for us, okay? And what we're going to try to do is after we do that, we're going to run it through a suite of functional and security tests to test, did it break the program, right? Is the program still working correctly? And did it actually fix the vulnerability, okay? And uh, so this is actually a, not an easy problem because it turns out that if you just, for example, go by the test that a developer writes, they're usually not going to be anywhere near sufficient to guarantee that the program actually works, right? So they're very weak proxies for the actual functionality of the program, okay? That caveat aside, uh, I'm gonna present some results on this and then talk about maybe how we can uh, try to beef up these sorts of functionality tests, okay? So uh, we're essentially taking this, uh, again, the, this sort of loop of saying, suppose that you've been handed a report of a vulnerability that says, yeah, I think in this function, there's a buffer overflow on line 123. Could you please do something about it for me, right? And you know, our motivation here is not necessarily that we want to replace the developers of active projects, because I think most developers do actually care about fixing vulnerabilities in their code. Uh, on the other hand, many projects get abandoned over time, right? And people still end up using this. And developer time is also quite precious, right? So we do want, if we can, to be able to automate this process of fixing vulnerabilities. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to take this report and we're going to take the report and turn it into essentially a comment in the source code that says, here's what the problem is. Here's what the old code was. Now, please essentially write the fixed version, okay? And I, then we're going to generate a bunch of different completions using uh, a bunch of different uh, code, code models. And then if it passes both the security and functional tests, we're going to, for now, declare it fixed with an asterisk that we're going to go back and look at whether it actually fixed many of them later on. Okay. So what does this look like? So this is an example of a vulnerability uh, in a program called libtiff. So this is an image parser. As a classic kind of um, buffer overflow, right? So this bound here, it turns out uh, this array that it's indexing into uh, source buffs is a fixed size, and that if SPP is too big, it will go past the end of it. Classic kind of buffer overflow. Okay. And so the prompt that we give it is we just say, "There's a bug here. It was a stack-based buffer overflow." And the old code was this version. And then we're just going to write a big fixed and say, language model, take it from here. Please write us the fixed version. Okay. Um, so you almost wouldn't expect this to work, but in fact, it often kind of does. So um, we took uh, a bunch of uh, our own kind of synthetic hand created examples. And it was actually able to solve all of those. And we're quite confident that it really did solve those because we had good tests for it, okay? On the other hand, uh, when we try this with more real world code, the problem with our synthetic code is it was fairly small because we just can't write tons and tons of, you know, we can't write a real world software project's worth of code for uh, this experiment. Uh, so if you start looking at uh, real world code, we took this data set of 12 historical vulnerabilities uh, that have been used in prior, prior work. And it actually managed to potentially repair 67% of those as well, okay? So this sounds good, but I wouldn't get too excited. So this is what it looks like when it goes well, okay? So it takes this vulnerable code. It, uh, further up here in some code that's not visible on the screen right now, it noticed that there is this variable max samples that was the bound of this source buffs array. 
And I said, oh, okay, I should probably generate some code that I both compares against FTP, but also compares against the maximum size of this array. Okay, so this uh, is a great fix, perfect fix. It's essentially uh, completely semantically equivalent to the fix the actual developers wrote when they fixed the problem. Um, so that's when it goes well. Right. On the other hand, uh, it doesn't always go well. Okay. So this is another way that one of the language models tried to fix this problem. And so here it was the problem was essentially that if you passed in a value of zero here, it would end up dividing by zero somewhere else. In the program. Okay. Well, the right way to fix that is maybe to check if it's zero and reject that. However, another way to fix it is just to remove those two options from the program, at which point it stops dividing by zero. And unfortunately, the test suite doesn't actually exercise these options. Okay. So according to the functionality tests, the program is still working as intended, but the patch is actually broken the program. Okay. So I think this is kind of an open problem that would be interesting to look at. So functionality tests are also code, right? So potentially we can try to write functionality tests as well. Um, now, how can we try and maybe uh, make sure that the functionality tests are actually correct? I think that, that we're going to have to try to take maybe much less general and much more fine-tuned and carefully curated models if we want uh, any hope of generating good functional tests. But that's one potential path to uh, fixing this kind of issue. Yeah. Is your method generate several potential patches? Yes. So in fact, yes. So this number, sixty-seven percent, is across uh, not only a bunch of potential patches for each model; it's a bunch of potential models, right? So we took each of these models, had each of them generate, uh, I believe, it was ten uh, examples per uh, vulnerability, right? Ten completions, um, and then asked, "Do any of these uh, fix the problem?" Right. I mean, I mean, you know, your rating is really high. I mean, that's sort of, would it be sensible to say we present several tests, several possibilities to the developers and ask them to choose? Right. So I think that that's also, you know, uh, this backs away from this idea of doing it all automatically, which I think is actually quite good in this case, because having a human in the loop would potentially avoid a lot of these issues with, oh, you just deleted the code and, you know, claim it. There are many working related to this industry. Mm -hmm. Many of these. Bugs don't have to be fixed. Yeah. Need to do it. So and your your techniques look great as long as you don't. Right, right. And if you if you look at kind of the way that uh, folks like so GitHub, for example, has started uh, issuing automated pull requests, right? Where they'll do a scan for a vulnerability, they'll try to generate uh, a patch automatically, but then they'll just sort of offer it as a suggestion and let the developers do their usual code review and decide whether it's going to end up in the code base. So a workflow like that might actually work quite well here as well. Okay. Uh, another thing that I want to call out here is as uh, sort of a more general problem as we start evaluating these models is the issue of training data contamination. Okay. So I mentioned that these were historical vulnerabilities, right? That means that the fixed versions may actually already be in the training data set, right? Now, normally, this is the kind of thing that I would be able to just check for because maybe I train the model, I know what the data set is. But with many of these large models, now they're unfortunately closed. Right, so our only access to them is via an API. So we can't actually go and say, "Was the fixed version in your training data set?" We can do that for uh, a version that we trained. So we trained our own code model, much much smaller, much much less capable. It was not very good at fixing bugs. But in one in one of the cases where it was capable of fixing a bug, we then went back and said, "Wait a second, the code you generated was that actually in your training data?" And it turned out in this case it was. Right. So in some cases, it's sort of cheating the evaluation metric, right? By relying on things that were already in its training set. Okay. Last kind of category here I want to talk about is this question of reverse engineering. So we've heard a little bit about malware analysis and use of machine learning and malware analysis. But a lot of malware analysis, at least for new malware, is still done manually by humans looking at disassembled or decompiled code. Okay. And that, that is very, very hard to scale. Um, and requires extremely expensive people um, who are able to read, say, x86 uh, or ARM assembly code. Okay, so one thing we might start by asking is, 
can these models actually give us the ability to get summaries or interesting information automatically about code that they're looking at? And if we now move away from source code and say, here's some binary code, some compiled code, maybe malicious code, and we ask existing tools like decompilers to turn them into sort of best effort source code, how do language models deal with, can they explain any aspects of these decompiled code as well? Okay. And so why do we think this might maybe be possible? So one thing that we did as an early experiment is we asked these language models. So uh, you can ask language models to essentially give you a vector that represents the code that they've seen, right? So you hand them a piece of code, a function maybe, and you get back a vector. And then if the embedding is a good one, you can then compare it to another uh, vector for a different function and ask how close are they together, okay? So we wanted to know, is it likely that these models might be able to handle decompiled code as well as human written source code, okay? And so we did this uh, kind of test where we took a you know, random program, LS, standard Unix program, and took along one axis, the original source code, and along the other axis, the decompiled version of the binary function, of each binary function, and asked how close together are the representations of these. So it was essentially a confusion matrix, right? And when things go well, you get this nice bright line down the center, right? That says that, yes, in fact, the decompiled version of a function was the closest one to the original source code, okay? Now, the one that looks really good over here, it's a really clear bright signal, that's when you leave debug symbols turned on, so it knows the names of all the functions, knows the names of variables and things like that. If in a more realistic case, you strip away debug symbols, the picture gets a lot noisier, right? But you can, still can actually see there is some signal present. There is still this diagonal line, right? So there's still some information being preserved that the model is able to pick up, okay? So that's why we maybe hoped it was going to work. And so we started saying things like, okay, here's a big chunk of code. I'm showing you a slide full of code. I do not expect you to read it. That's why we have the language model. So <laughs> instead, we started, started saying things like, what's the purpose of this code? Okay, well, um, we can play a bunch with some of the parameters of this language model. So this is the uh, setting called temperature. And this effectively just says, when you're trying to generate outputs and you're sampling from that probability distribution we saw at the beginning, how likely are you to pick things that are not the most likely option, right? So sort of how much randomness are you going to have in your generation, okay? And so at low temperatures, temperature zero, it will actually correctly say that this is a server that can delete files in your directory, okay? So that's pretty good. Um, if you start to turn the temperature up, it starts to kind of make stuff up. Uh, it starts to sound like kind of an undergraduate who's been asked um, an exam question they don't really know the answer to, just to battle a little bit. Um, in some cases, when you turn the temperature up, uh, it just gives up on English entirely um, and starts outputting Russian. Um, we actually asked a, a Russian speaker, and this doesn't actually mean anything in Russian either. Um, but at low temperatures, it does actually do somewhat well. Um, it's not uniformly the case that low temperatures are always good. Sometimes if you set the temperature very low, it will give sort of a very literal answer or uh, one that is not particularly helpful. Um, so, you know, it will just say that uh, you can, that it sends a directory from uh, the client to the server, which is very helpful. But if you just turn the temperature up a little bit, it will actually explain what the code does, okay? Um, Right, and it can, in some cases, give you fairly detailed information about the protocol that's being used by this program, okay? Um, and so this is, I don't know, I, this uh, strikes me almost as a, a little bit magical sometimes that I can actually ask questions in natural language and get correct answers, at least about source code, right? So this is potentially, assuming we can uh, trust these results and get some faith they're correct, something you could give to uh, an analyst who maybe isn't as skilled um, and still allow them to get some information about some new malware set, right? Okay. Uh, but things kind of fell apart when we started to look at this systematically. So the problem with these sort of, uh, you know, 
open-ended questions like this is they're very hard to evaluate, right? What's the correct answer to? What's the purpose of this code? Um, so instead, we switch things around to a true-false kind of framework. We just asked them a sequence of yes or no questions about the code where we knew the answers ahead of time. Okay. And I, you know, again, this is a preliminary result, and we're working on seeing if we can improve things, but at the moment it doesn't really work. Okay. So if you look at the number of questions it gets correct, um, and the number of questions, it's pretty close to random guessing at the moment. Okay. Um, and the reason for this, we think, is that right now, Decompiled code, there's not very much decompiled code on GitHub, right? So we're working right now on fine tuning a model that takes a capable uh, model trained on human written source code and then fine tunes it on uh, decompiled source code with the hope that we can transfer some of these capabilities. Okay. Okay. All right. So I'm going to try and wrap up here because I expect I'm running out of time. But if we start to look beyond, you know, I think that right now these large models are very new, and I think they're in some cases sort of vastly underused in software security, right? If we look at the kinds of uh, models that are being used right now in software security, there's something on the order of a thousand times smaller than the ones that you can get by using GitHub Copilot, right? And this is kind of a disadvantage uh, that we're at as academic researchers, right? I don't have the $20 million or whatever it was to train uh, GPT-3. Um, so, you know, we may have to be a little bit uh, more creative or just ask funding agencies for a lot more money than we used to. Um, I don't think they're going to go for that, but we'll try. Um, but we should try actually doing things like scaling up, right? We do have the benefit in software security that we have tons and tons of fantastic data, right? We have things like compilers that can give us very good semantic information about source code, right? They can tell us things like the data types of variables. They can tell us the exact correspondence between binary code and source code. So, you know, I think that we're kind of leaving a lot of money on the table here potentially, and this is going to be a very exciting area for the next few years. So, what other things do we look at? Um, well, we did look at things like improving decompilation, right? So, we already saw uh, that traditional decompilers will often end up with things that don't look very much like human authored source code. Maybe we can use things like natural uh, neural machine translation, same things that Google Translate uses to give us better decompilers. We might be able to improve things like fuzz testing. So maybe we can create uh, better harnesses that let us test individual pieces of uh, code inside a larger application without having to test the entire program at once. Maybe we can try to generate exploits automatically to prove that vulnerabilities are actually serious, right? And maybe we could get better at doing things like summarizing binary code. Um, so it's kind of some preliminary work. It's a workshop paper uh, that we had uh, just a couple months ago, where we said, let's try this kind of machine translation approach. And we weren't the first to do this, but we were uh, the first to do it with some of these newer uh, transformer-based models and to try with slightly larger models, slightly larger data, um, and also to start looking beyond code that was written in C, okay? So it turns out that there's lots of new languages out there that compile down to uh, x86 binary, like Rust, uh, ones that are not so new, like Fortran, which is significantly older than I am. Um, so uh, then there's things like OCaml, uh, and all of these potentially are things that we might want to decompile as well, and we don't want a decompiler that's been hand-tuned over the past 30 years for C code, right? So that was the potential uh, goal here. I will say, you know, if you start looking at this, you'll notice some things that will make you uh, kind of uncomfortable. Like the decompiled version of this one changes n plus one to n times n minus one, which is totally wrong, right? From a character level, they're quite similar, but semantically they're totally different, right? So I think there's a lot more work to be done there on kind of tuning these sort of translation models so that they understand and care a lot more about these sorts of semantically meaningful issues and less about getting uh, you know, sort of individual characters correct. Okay, we can also let's start looking at things like saying, uh, can we generate uh, fuzz harnesses? I'm not gonna say too much about this just because uh, you know, we haven't done very much work on it yet. Um, but the idea here is essentially that if you want to run a buzzer on your code, generate random inputs and throw it at it, 
you're going to run into this issue that either you just say, give it a file of random jump and tell it to try and test the whole program, or you have to actually really understand the code and write a much more targeted RNS for your fuzzer. They can say, here's how I exercise this specific API function. Okay, so bridging that gap um, is something where I think we could potentially use these kinds of code generation models. Okay, uh, I do want to throw in one note here about um, doing evaluations going forward. So all very exciting times, research is moving very fast, but we do actually have lots of work that's not machine learning based um, on how to test programs. And we should kind of be mindful of the fact that we need to be doing appropriate comparisons against sort of the strongest version of the non-machine learning version, right? So uh, I'm not gonna pick on them too much, it's an innocent mistake, but there's, this was a paper from 2019 uh, that described a way to build a fuzzer that used neural networks, okay? And what it would do is given an input, it would try to predict what path through a program that input would take, okay? And uh, the idea was that then, if you wanted to reach a new part of the program, exercise new behavior, maybe find bugs in that part of the program, you could use the neural network to tell you how you should modify the input so as to reach that part of the program, okay? And they had great numbers. They showed that they were beating this uh, state-of-the-art buzzer called uh, AFL. Uh, but later in independent replications, there was one uh, in ICSI uh, this year, and we've also did a little bit of work uh, independently trying to replicate this ourselves. And it does not really confirm the findings very well. Uh, so this is just a sample of that result. So this green line up top, this shows basically how much of the program it's managed to explore over time. And this green line that's winning in all three of these programs is not the machine learning approach. Okay? It is the standard buzzer that they compared against, but using a configuration option for it that causes it to skip certain stages and be a little bit more random. Okay? So when you compare against a slightly stronger baseline, non-machine learning baseline, it turns out not to beat that, okay? Slightly worse, and this is something we found, is that it turns out it doesn't seem like the neural network is actually helping it at all, okay? So we took the neural network uh, in, the, in this approach, we replaced it with a randomly trained one, right? So one that was essentially randomly initialized, was not trained on data at all, and compared it against the official version, and they do actually about as well. So uh, the neural network isn't actually helping them, okay? So, you know, what do we take from this? First, pick strong baselines that actually use the state of the art, right? And not just the state of the art among work that uses machine learning, but state of the art among what we know how to, how we know to approach this problem. So this is easier than it was back in 2018 when that paper was written, because at least with buzzing, we now have uh, this nice tool called AFL++ that kind of implements a bunch of state-of-the-art techniques and has very good defaults, okay? Another thing is to use ablation testing. Ablation testing means you take your system and you remove parts of it one at a time, replace them with things, with dummy components that do nothing, and see if it actually still works as well, right? It is unfortunately very easy to fool yourself into thinking this neural network is giving you great benefits when it's not doing anything. Okay. So I'm gonna finish up here. Uh, I guess what I'll say is that I do think that these sort of co-generating models are probably here to stay. Um, so according to GitHub, the folks who actually uh, were led to this technical preview and tried it, 50% um, of them have kept it enabled, right? So that's a pretty good adoption for a new product. Um, I'm one of them. I actually find it very, very useful and find it slightly painful to write code entirely manually now. Um, which is not great for plane flights without internet access, but um, you know it is actually quite useful uh, when it works. And so I think we probably need to uh, work on making it work better and making it work more securely rather than saying just don't use it, right? Um, so you know I also think that more generally these kinds of code models have potentially tons and tons of uses and they're not being properly kind of exploited at the moment and that we could actually uh, do a lot of good in software security by trying to apply them to the product we have. So, all right, that is it for me. Uh, if you want to read more about this, there's 
uh, some papers you can go look at. Um, love to take questions. There was one question online uh, was what are the security problems of a linked list implementation? Right. So this was in uh, a C program. So uh, the kinds of things are, uh, for example, uh, we had a function that asked uh, to basically uh, store a linked list that had uh, a name and a value, right? And the name was a string, and the string had a maximum length. So you can have classic buffer overflows depending on how you implement this add uh, item functionality. Um, it also has some functionality to load a list from a file on uh, from a text file on disk. So if that file was malformed or you know not correctly formatted, you might have null pointer uh, issues. Um, and then finally, you might have things that are not necessarily security uh, issues, but are just uh, wasteful. So whether it leaks memory and things like that. Um, so yeah, the, those are the types of issues we're looking for. So we have a, a reception, some with, with uh, drinks and uh, canapes, but maybe we can take one quick question. If there is any. Uh, thanks, Roman. Uh, grateful. Um, oh, yes, because I, I like the topic. But it was a great topic. So I'm going to take another like, two questions. Very good question. Uh, what, is, what, is, what is basically, so do you believe that's all? Uh, do you believe that having a curated data set might help? I, I understand that this stuff fits a little bit the goal of self learning, like the goal and labels of you just go out and try to learn. But um, do you believe that actually having over time that kind of you know, curated data set might help? Yeah, and so I think that in particular, I think this more curated data set that you know is going to be much more expensive to cure to collect than just scraping GitHub. Um, that you know, a more targeted data set that's much higher quality that could be used to then uh, fine tune a model or use. Uh, there's also techniques to use reinforcement learning um, to give a positive and negative examples and update the weights uh, that way. I think something like that could be very, very valuable. Um, it's again the kind of data set, that it's, it's not the kind of work that's particularly sexy because it involves you know going over a bunch of code and labeling, you know, this part is vulnerable, this is high quality, this is low quality, and so on. Um, but I think it could be very helpful, yes. A very other question. So when you said that uh, you tried to look for um, whether the secure version or the patch version was in the training data set yes. or not. So do you believe that uh, this would kind of you know, be related to drifting in a way? So actually having a sort of a confidence level that says, okay, this is a prediction, but hey, very low quality, so really don't trust it, or versus the other. Yeah, potentially. And I didn't really uh, touch on this. Um, during the talk, but the, the models do actually give some type of confidence score um, because you know as you generate uh, and sample from this distribution, those conditional probabilities over time you can multiply them up, and that gives you an overall confidence in the output you just generated. Um, and so I you know we have at least seen that you know the uh, most confidence solutions did tend to be somewhat better um, overall. Uh, so trying to incorporate that knowledge um, and maybe, you know, if you're using this in Copilot, flagging it as like a potentially low quality uh, answer could be one thing that uh, could help avoid these kind of problems. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. If you have any more questions, please bother, bother us <laughs> during, the, uh, during the reception. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you. Thank you.